Can we go back. <coughs> yeah, that's true. Let's see how my stand was. Good evening. With this meeting of the Oyster River School Committee, please come to order. And for those who wish, join us in the first I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And before we go into public comment, I want to say that we have, as yet, not clarified the policy on public speaking. And since you all know how I interpret that policy, and not everybody agrees with me, I'm tonight going to turn, ask Tom to take the chair. Okay, could I get a show of hands how many people would like to speak in public comment? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so um, we can allow about three minutes for each person. Um, so we want to start. It won't take me that long. Identify <laughs> yourself. Uh, uh, good evening to the board. It's nice to see all of you and whatnot. Uh, the reason I'm here uh, this evening is that I would like to give a sizable check to the school district, namely the um, track fund and whatnot. I want it strictly to go to the track fund, so see if we can't get started on our track. We've got a lot of talented people here, and our school children deserve better than what they're getting, as far as I'm concerned. So for an early Christmas, I want to give a sizable check to the school, but it's going strictly for the track fund. It's not to buy refrigerators or anything <laughs> else. <laughs> and, and my daughter, both my daughter and I are going to give this check. My daughter that's sitting right behind me is a triathlon person, a marathon runner, long distance runner, and every other kind of stuff, whatever they, whatever they do. I don't know. She's always on the go. So what I'm going to do is uh, present this to Todd Allen and see that it gets in the right fund. And let's see if we can't get this track fund started and have a nice track where kids can go and our adults can go also. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn and give it to okay. Todd. Todd, I'd love to Thank you. Thank you. For those of you, everybody knows Shirley, but she has been involved in this effort right from the beginning when we started uh, raising money for the track back in 98. In fact, I think you were on the board at that yes, time. Yes, I was. The program was set up. Mm -hmm. And so it means a lot um, to really kind of jumpstart our efforts. And, and, and Corey Parker and I will be coming back to you sometime in the near future, mm -hmm. hopefully, to talk to you more specifically about how we want to make this happen, because we really want to make this a reality before I retire. <laughs> and, before, sure. and before I retire. There you go. Sure. <laughs> never, so never. Thank you, Shirley. It means a lot. To uh, mm. kids of the district and to the district. Well, so. the, our students come first. I thought that was our, uh, you know, our main thing is Absolutely. the stu what's good for the students. Absolutely. And we've got a lot of talented, talented students because I keep track of all that type of thing. Plus, keep track of my daughter too. Yeah. <laughs> <That's what laughs> <I do. laughs> she is very, very well thought of, and whatnot. And I do thank you all for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you Shirley. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Eric Mason of Durham. Um, there's three things I'd like to leave you folks with to think about. Um, as a family and one of a student with special needs uh, who will directly and most negatively be impacted uh, by the proposed K through four option, uh, we support the managed enrollment that keeps K through four. Um, our child's in the second year of the PEP program. Um, and he's transitioning into kindergarten next year um, as part of the regular school year. Uh, <clears throat> I can unequivocally tell you that our son wouldn't have progressed as well as he has uh, over this last school year um, if it had not been for the, the great staff and being in a consistent setting for the last two years. This is analogous to the K through two, uh, three through four model in terms of 
not having such a short uh, window there. So if he had been forced to go into kindergarten the following year, after his first year, he probably wouldn't have done as well. Actually, I have no doubt about it. Um, being in the same school environment, uh, as we are all only you know, six months from the end, um, it's hard to believe. Uh, really, just, it just goes by too fast. Um, there's a level of trust and understanding that families and the ed educators need to uh, establish to ensure optimal learning. Um, and a longer continuum has really proven to bolster our son's progress. Um, and we've witnessed this firsthand. Uh, these are dynamic working relationships. There are a lot of twists and turns to them. Uh, and it gets too lost. It gets too easy to get lost along the path for not just the student but for the family. Um, so, in order to help maintain that consistency, the longer continuum is definitely you know, the optimal way to go. <coughs> when we first moved to the district, we originally were thinking <laughs> Mohammed would be the ideal. Um, quite honestly, we don't really care. Both Mohammed and Massway are great schools, and at the end of it, we moved for the district, not for one particular school or another. Um, so for anyone considering, you know, why, you know, K through four would be, yeah, would be better for one school or the other, they're both great. Um, there's been some concerns or debate I've heard through uh, different people saying that K through two, three through four will all have negative implications on real estate. It, it, quite honestly, I think it's ill-founded you know, ill and unsubstantiated, you know, limitedly anecdotal at best. Um, to say something like that, I think it really discredits the great school that is Mastway uh, by assuring families that move to the district that they will undeniably get Moharamit as a K through two, three through four setup. Um, I think it's insulting to Moharamit teachers as well, thinking that you know that that's the only way that they're going to get students through there uh, is through this K through two, three through four model. Um, you know, so I think if anyone in the real estate business here is pushing that model, um, you know, I think if there is any veracity to it. You know, I think it's better rooted in educating the real estate professionals on how to effectively market and communicate the reputation of the school district better, um, rather than myopically pitting one school versus the other to, as a selling tool there. That's all I have for comments. Thank you very Thank much. You. Hello, Vail Cox, Madbury. Um, I'm really not trying to make a habit of coming up here, uh, but I would like to say, hopefully for a final time, that I'm for a K-4 system and retaining the two great schools that we have. I'm opposed to splitting our schools into two smaller grade span, K-2, to 3, 4, with additional transition. Um, as you deliberate tonight, um, I hope that any comparison chart would be certain to have each model's actual ability to achieve numbers equity as a line item. Um, the two facilities, Mastway and Moherment, has a one classroom difference, and a one room difference does not a grade make. This uh, transition to a different configuration would um, essentially ensure that as we move forward, we would forever have numbers and equity, should we do it. Um, the latest material that came out in the agenda materials shows some leveling of numbers and um, this is only occurring due to the finagling of the grades and uh, shifting um, them during what's titled the reorganization period. Um, so with that in mind too, I would also hope that the extra degree of splitting moherment only families who have children straddling this reorganizational time frame is a line item on the chart because this is a specific impact to a certain population of our community that um, absolutely needs to be considered under your deliberations. And um, uh, being one of those families, I think it has um, negative impacts on our family. Um, in the materials, too, I did see uh, what looked to be updated materials, and yet uh, a PowerPoint slideshow did say still that a positive for a K234 was that it eliminates modulars. And we all know today that it is, does not, so I'm just assuming that's an error. And I just want to make sure that that's known for the public. Unless I'm in error and you can correct me later. Um, and lastly, <coughs> well, maybe, maybe not lastly, but uh, for comparison options, um, I believe that the representation of um, saying both configurations represent the small school 
uh, effect is misleading <coughs> because I think uh, throughout all general literature, uh, it is um, it is stated that the uh, small school uh, description domain is not applicable when talking about the same number of students in a smaller grade span configuration. When uh, it's described as when there are larger children within one grade span, the actual opposite effect of greater peer support um, occurs in that it's like the small fish in a big sea. And there's a little bit of loss of sense of self and direction and that effect. So I uh, respectfully disagree with the comparison chart as it is, and I hope you take that under consideration as you look at it. Lastly, um, while I have been involved in this issue starting in the fall, Hi. thank you. I am in full support of K4. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Little musical chairs uh, <laughs> going on tonight. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Dean Rubin from uh, Lee. Uh, I think I'll switch topics for a second and talk about uh, tuition. I've, uh, I'll, I'll expand on my comments from last time, which is that I'm currently not in support of the uh, new market option. Uh, <coughs> besides the enrollment uh, numbers, which I actually don't think are quite as bad as that chart looks. I'm not sure we're counting the 60 vocational students are half are half day, so they don't really take a full seat. Uh, but anyway, but even even with that, I I don't, I don't think it's uh, right at the current time. I think uh, what New Market's going to do is uh, fix their current building and keep their kids there. So uh, rather than be jilted at the altar, I would uh, pass on that option. Uh, my problems include the uh, contract. I don't think the uh, contract c comes up for review often enough, unless this has changed since I last read it. it seems to work. If we do go forward, we're stuck for a long time. Uh, I think the tuition is too low, and I'm worried that the contract will further reduce the tuition. I haven't been assured that uh, the uh, formula for adjusting the tuition won't adjust it down. Um, and it, you know, at this point, New Market is saying if they send their kids to here, their cost per middle school student is going to go up, basically around forty percent. So you know, and that sort of makes the deal impossible if that's true from from their side. So uh, I don't want to belabor that too much. And on the uh, on the other thing, let me put in the final pitch for what I call the family exception, which uh, we used to call the grand word. Uh, I, I saw the analysis in the agenda. I think that's too complicated. All, all, all we really have to do is grant. If you have a kid in Muharramit today, you can send your kids to Muharramit from now on. Uh, it doesn't solve the imbalance, I, I'll agree, but I don't think people care that much. I think they would rather stay in their school, and uh, if they do care enough, well, let's say if you want to send your kids to Mass Lake, you can send your kids to Mass Lake. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Beth Holly. I live in Durham. I have two children currently enrolled at Moharamit, Chris in the second grade and Bridget in kindergarten. We live in Durham on Sandy Brook Drive, which is one of the streets where kids would have to switch from Moharamit to Mast Way should we choose to go forward with the option where bus lines are redrawn. I'm encouraged by the discussion and considerations that would give family the option to be grandfathered into their current school should the bus lines be redrawn. We'd really love for our kids to be able to stay at Moharamit where they've established roots. <coughs> we've developed relationships with other families and staff and where we've invested much of our energy over the past years. With this in mind, the grandfathering clause is of interest to us. That said, if we were grandfathered into Moharamit, but there was no transportation available to, for the kids to get there, as a family with two working parents, the grandfathering option wouldn't be a choice for us. Um, it may sound trivial, but realistically, the sheer logistics of transporting the kids both ways would be prohibitive, prohibitive for us to stay at Moharamit. I know the overall intent is to get parity between the schools while limiting the impact on current families. To truly limit that impact, if the board moves forward with the bus redistricting option, but grandfathers and families who are already at Moharamit, 
I would ask that consideration be given to a transportation option that would allow us to stay. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Michael Williams from Durham. I'm here tonight because I'm strongly in favor of a K-4 elementary model. But first, I want to say uh, I wanted to commend you and thank you for all the work that you've done on the tuition issue. That's been a very open, transparent process in public over a long time where we've exposed all the issues, and I think that's fantastic. I wish we could do the same thing with our elementary enrollment situation. We've talked about solution, 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 but we haven't really talked about what the problem is. And the only problem that we've really identified and agreed on is we have a few more kids at Moharamut than we like to have there. A lot of the things around K234 are addressing problems that we don't agree on. And if we want to address those, we should follow a community-wide process to really expose those and dig through them in a thorough way. I want to talk about some other districts in New England that have done that. Middleborough, Massachusetts, converted from K235 to K5 after a committee review. Milford, Connecticut, is currently a, a split grade level model that is, um, they're reviewing that in their LRPC. It was a major issue in the recent election, turnover of several board members, and they will probably will be moving back to K5. Portsmouth conducted an extensive review over several months uh, in 2012 and unanimously re recommended sticking with the K5 model. Hopkinton, Massachusetts, which we, I think um, Dr. Morse uh, referenced earlier, has done this not once but twice. About 12 years ago, they switched to a split grade level model. In 2010, they reviewed it again and recommended splitting back or, or changing back to a K-5 model. And uh, Woodbury and Bethlehem, Connecticut, reconfigured to a K-2-3-5 against public outcry, actually ended up in having a referendum where they, where they were forced to change back to a K-5 model. If we really think that's the way to go, we need to have a broader community discussion about what we're trying to achieve and move in that direction. Thanks. Hi, Rob McKeown, Mabry. Um, I've said probably as much as I need to say on this issue, I think. Um, I sent you guys this study this, this, this week, which is the, uh, uh, an analysis of uh, school configurations throughout the country. And uh, the couple of numbers I wanted to get sort of on the public record there for you to remember was that out of over um, well over 50,000 elementary schools in this country who uh, have K through 4 within that system, be it a K through 4 system through to a K through 12 system. Um, 46,256 are K3 or greater K through, K through K8 systems. There are only 530 K2 schools in this country. There are only 139 grade level three, four schools in this country. That would be one out of 300, one of every 348 schools would be that, that, that span level. So we've talked about, that while there haven't been studies saying that that model, or the split model doesn't work, well, it's, while we can agree that a wide grade, grade, grade range split model might work, it might be convenient, it might work for some districts, we don't have the luxury of having a K4 and then a 6, 8 or something like that. We have we, we have smaller schools and we would have to be forced into a K2 and a 3-4. And that's just too small a grade span range for those schools. We, that nobody's doing it in this country, right? And, uh, you know, K5 and K6, they're by far the most popular um, uh, configurations. Well over 25,000 K6 schools in the country. We'd be moving away from that. It's a step backwards. Let's get K2, 3, 4 off the table, stick with our K4 system, and go from there. Solve those problems um, and go from there. Thanks a lot. Hi, Jocelyn O'Quinn, Durham. Um, I forgot you were having this meeting tonight. I just got reminded. So I'm not sure what I want to say. Um, but I think I've been pretty consistent throughout this process. Um, I, as a parent, can see the benefits of a K-2, 3, 4 model. I don't think it's a perfect model. Um, in my dream school district, there would be K-6 through six, um, or K-5 through five, or K-8. through eight. Um, But I understand that for financial reasons, that might not be possible. So for me, the next best option, as I see it for my children, would be the K through two. And I believe that there are a lot of academic benefits. And if I had to guess, I would think that's maybe why the leadership team is in support of it. Although 
Um, I don't know if they'll be speaking tonight, but we did hear that the leadership team supports that model. Um, as a parent, I can see the benefits of grouping children. Um, for example, in terms of um, like sunshine math at Mass Way, we don't have that at Moharamut. And as a parent, I think that's very strange. So I think that if we had all the grades together, we would actually provide more enrichment for children and be able to target their needs because there'd be a wider group to group them with. Um, so I also want to say I'm one of the people who has um, complained that Moharamut is overcrowded. And I think you finally really understand this. I know many people on the board um, don't you know what's going on in Moharamut, but um, there are special ed services in the hallway. That's not ideal. There's silent lunch, although I think that might have been fixed. Um, so, you know, something has to give here. And I think, unfortunately, the um, redistricting, I know parents don't want that, and I certainly understand. And I also think that the managed enrollment could really impact our um, property value, but also our communities and that as a parent I don't know if any of you remember what it's like to move to a new community with young children but I would not want to move to a community where my child is the only child in the neighborhood who's going across town to a different school so I think that if you made a decision like that tonight that would be um, it would have effects on on town and the real estate and the sense of community so good luck <laughs> I just want to give my two cents and I'm sure you'll make a good decision thank you Uh, my name is Jacqueline Brune, and uh, we live in Durham, and we just moved here a couple months ago. Um, I am completely against the K2, 3, 4 model and have been from the get-go in favor of the K4, the fewer transitions. Um, the teachers have very clearly come out there and not in favor of this. Um, the loss of the UNH interns, you know, our system is really not broken. Both Mastway and Moharriman are excellent schools. Um, the one thing that I would speak particularly to, we just moved here and when we bought our house, we looked at the distance to the schools and where we live, we're about four or five miles, I think, from Moharamit and the bus gets to our house the end of the day between 4.05 and 4.10 um, because it's the last wave bus. And I have a really hard time believing if the distance to an elementary school was doubled, which it would be, that they would, how that could not be affected um, and that the kids, the littlest kids in the district would be on the bus even longer um, or waiting <coughs> for their bus and then on the bus for longer. So just to reiterate, I um, fully support keeping the K-4 system. Thank you. Jack, what was your last name again? Brune. Brune. I think we have time for one more speaker. Hmm. <laughs> Yep. Hi, Kristen Eckhart, Durham, and I'm in support of the current K-4 model. Uh, if you vote to do away with Moharam and Massway as we know them, there's a strong likelihood that the alternative configuration will result in new and significant problems to tackle. In hindsight, will the pickle of a few more kids in some classes seem trivial compared to the negative repercussions that could very well result from imposing an unpopular configuration on our community? For instance, are you prepared for addressing low morale among faculty and staff, the majority of whom expressed opposition to this model? We can say that our wonderful teachers are all professionals, which they are, who will rise to the occasion, but they're also people in an institution, no matter how well run by our wonderful principals and other administrators. When an institution imposes unwelcome changes on this scale, we risk permanently damaging the sense of belonging and investment that are at the very core of why the faculty and staff at both schools are so treasured. I also question the feasibility of the promise of common grade-wide planning time, touted as one of the main benefits of the proposed model. Common planning time is tip, uh, typically happens when classes across a grade are simultaneously at specials. Is this even possible with, say, seven or eight classes within a grade? Are there enough specialist teachers and facilities to make this work? If there are, what's to say that two established cultures are going to find it productive to sit down in meetings that would be double the size in terms of attendance but have the same amount of time to hammer out the details of a brand new school also implementing Common Core? 
It was a nice idea on paper, but from my perspective as a veteran teacher, it seems far-fetched that in reality this would look anything like what was described in the proposal. So please consider both the unintended consequences that inevitably result from upheaval on this scale and the feasibility of the claims of what could be accomplished if Massway and Moharamit are dismantled. Are you absolutely convinced, based on the evidence that you've been presented, that this experiment would result in two schools that are at least as good as the ones that we already have. Because that's, if that's not the outcome and this notion does turn out to be a bad idea, what do we do then? Thank you. One more speaker. Hi, I'm Rachel Higginbotham from Durham and I want to thank you for taking public comment and listening to the community. I'm speaking today in support of our K-4 model. I think it's actually unfortunate that this reconfiguration debate has arisen from a problem with enrollment, not a problem that was arisen from um, people bringing up concerns about the current school configuration. So as presented, the issue here is a numbers issue, which in the grand schemes of, scheme of things seems to be somewhat of a minor issue, which seems to be best solved by using an appropriately measured solution at a suitable scale. I see this K234 proposal as a drastic change and one which we really have very little knowledge to predict the losses, gains, and impacts. It's a relatively untested model, especially the 3 4 configuration. And given the lack of compelling evidence for the need to change our current configuration, I feel this is an unjustified and inconsidered risk to our children and community. I hope you keep that in mind as you debate tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> we got minutes. Um, I move to <coughs> approve the minutes of December 4th and December 11th. Second. Any corrections? Uh, I've got a couple. Okay. Um, all very minor. Um, and let me <coughs> get to them. Um, I was asked, um, there was a public comment from uh, Val Cox um, in the first meeting, and she was speaking against the K234 um, option. And the way it's worded, it looks as she was uh, speaking for the K2. Um, there was the vote on uh, one of the policies where I um, recused myself. And the vote was listed as, I think, 6 1, so it should be that 6 0 1. I thought that's how it was. 6 1, I thought it was. It should be 6 0. Is one. that the correct way? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 6 0 1. And the <coughs> last one, when we were talking about um, the warrant articles, um, I had moved to separate <coughs> warrant article 5 from the whole, um, the whole scheme, and I don't think that was. Um, worded in, as such, and I could help you with that word. Did you move or did you request? Uh, I, he I moved, but there was no second. Right. Um, I think there was. I think Maria second. We I think voted you tried to amend it, didn't it? It was a little confusing. I yeah. moved to uh, separate the question. Right. But that was after the motion had been made. To let, let me just try to get it. I'm sorry. Um, so it's, it's before Maria's one, I, right, there was no second. I moved mm -hmm. Warren Article 5 for the first vote. I moved to remove Warren Article 5 is what I did. Right. Right. And there was no second. No right. second. Right. So is it correct? It's not, I moved to, to remove, it says I moved Warren Article 5, but moved I was to moved remove. to remove. So you need the word add, the word remove needs to be added in. <coughs> correct. Okay. Exactly. Thanks, yeah. Kenny. Thank you. Okay. With those changes, are we ready to approve? Take a vote. All in favor? All opposed? 7 0 in favor with student rep voting in favor. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, in terms of the meeting, we thought we would skip, move right directly to the major issues of the meeting. Is that agreeable to everyone? So we if there are accommodations or 
announcements that they can either be made through the, you know, from the superintendent or um, they can be held to the next meeting. Is that all right? Okay. So, um, Dr. Morris, I'm wondering if you could get us started on the tuition decision that we have before us. Thank you. Yeah. So today, um, board members, you got a copy of the finalized agreement with Barrington, and there is no finalized agreement with Newmarket. Um, the conversation that I had with Newmarket was that the superintendent wanted you to know that he was speaking on behalf of uh, Newmarket and that um, they have agreed to the same conditions through him that the school board in Barrington has voted to agree. Uh, on so um, in one case the school board hasn't voted new market the other case Barrington has voted as a uh, in that paperwork is with me um, we've talked about the fame framework several times and the framework has been in the public domain for a very long time at this point but one of the things that has changed since we started this conversation with new market in Barrington nearly a year and a half ago and even before that with previous boards and previous superintendents the big change that has occurred is the enrollment numbers and why this is meaningful is um, our school board and largely our community and our teaching staff have all indicated that they get mm -hmm. uncomfortable with our enrollment going past 900 in the and so for about a year and a half, that only happened once, and it was 902, so it was somewhat, you know, it wasn't earth shattering. With the latest numbers from the Long Range Planning Committee, as you can see, it happens uh, quite frequently, and it's significantly more than two. Though I do want to recognize Dean's comment because he's absolutely right that we do have to account for the fact that um, New Market has about um, uh, 80, 60 to 80 kids who do the Vogue School, and so in any given moment, only half of them would be um, going to the high school. But I think this is an important piece of data because we have heard consistently, not just from this body, but from the community about school culture and the concern of what happens to our high school if it grows from 680 students to a high on this chart of 947 and um, that seems to be you know a pretty significant component of the conversation um, across the district so I just wanted to highlight this because this this is a significant change so if I'm going to keep compare and contrast the two agreements um, New Market was offering us an exclusive arrangement with 254 students showing up in the fall of 2015. Barrington has never wanted an exclusive arrangement because they actually um, have what's called choice and they send their children to uh, Oyster River, to Co Brown, and to Dover. Um, as I said, the Barrington Board has voted and signed um, a, 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 a contract if this board is willing to do, do so. The New Market Board has not. I just to stop for a second and just say how much I appreciate the work that has happened with both the New Market representatives as well as the Barrington res, uh, representatives. Both superintendents have been stellar to work with. Both. Um, teams uh, of, uh, of representatives from the school boards have been fantastic to work with and I think we would be remiss if we didn't recognize that we were dealing with really um, high integrity uh, people. Uh, the length of the contract is different. Uh, Barrington was looking for at least 15 years. Initially they were looking for 20 years. Uh, Barrington is looking for 10 years. And when we get past 10 years, we just assume annual renewal. And at any given point, if uh, Barrington or Oyster River said, you know, this isn't working out for one or the other of us, uh, it has a built-in four-year notice. Why four years? 
uh, because I think morally and ethically, once we accept a Barrington student, <coughs> we need to fulfill our obligation to them. So a freshman coming in, the agreement um, dissolves, that freshman would be able to occupy a noise service seat until they graduate as a senior. A similar arrangement with the new market. The other major difference between Barrington and Newmarket is the all or nothing uh, kind of approach in terms of the number of students. This board in public said, you know, if we're going to continue the conversation with Barrington, we really need to have a place where we at least guaranteed a base. Um, Barrington agreed to that. And what they have agreed to is a set of benchmarks in terms of growth up to 125 students that essentially say, Oyster River, you can predict X number of students from us in 2015. If we don't reach that number, we guarantee to pay you 95% of what we would pay you um, had all those children uh, come in. And the reason that was important to us is if we staff up to meet the needs of uh, incoming Barrington students, we really don't want to be left um, hiring staff, paying for staff that ultimately we don't need. So they were willing to do that. That is a major concession from Barrington. They have never made that commitment to anyone before, but they really wanted um, their children to be able to have us as an option. Of course, that's not, uh, not an issue with Newmarket because we get all of their children. Uh, school of record, immediately, because we've taken <coughs> all of Newmarket children, we would be a school of record, and the school of record simply means that any child has a right to attend Oyster River as if Oyster River were in their community, meaning we, ad we assume all rights and responsibilities associated with the education of that child, <coughs> including special needs populations or accelerated learner populations. The, I, I skipped over the tuition piece. Um, so the tuition piece for both uh, is $14,000 per student. And, you know, again, you know, the comment about it may be too low because we in Oyster River are paying $16,300 per student. What I, w I continue to say is it's really not about 14000 versus 16300 It's about zero versus 16300 and this is a significant increase over what um, Barrington is paying us under our annual MOU of uh, 13000 But what it represents is a blended rate. So we're getting away from special ed standing out as a unique cost unless it involves hiring student-specific personnel. And in that case, Barrington would pay for that or Newmarket would pay for that. So. I don't want to leave the impression that the blended rate doesn't incorporate a cost associated with special needs that are unique to a given child. This is program cost, not student specific cost. And then, you know, the common criteria we offered non voting representation to either body, much like Peter. They would sit at the table, they would be able to have conversations about um, their high school students that are attending here. They would be able to join you in conversations about policy discussions, but in the event of a tie, they can't be the tiebreaker. No, no different than Peter. If we go into a non-meeting or a non-public meeting, they couldn't attend. No, again, no different than Peter. So Peter actually is our poster boy for this, <laughs> for this particular idea that we would agree to meet with um, either board, whichever school system you choose, twice a year, that this does not include student transportation, that, but both of them have the option of us discussing uh, potentially offering student transportation as an addendum in the future at a cost, that both school systems have committed to curriculum coordination and professional development so that when their eighth grade students come into the high school, um, they'll have a sense of what to expect. Dispute resolution is pretty straightforward. It starts with the superintendents. And this is the same in both of them. If it fails there, it could go to mediate, uh, goes to the boards. If it fails there, it goes to mediation. If it fails mediation, it would go to the state board. 
Uh, this does not include capital costs. Uh, payment procedure is they, in October 1st, we would finalize the first half of the year and they would pay us for the first half based on October 1st. Then in the middle of January, we would adjust up or down depending on the enrollment from the given school system and we would charge them again. And at the end of the school year, there's no, no such thing as carry forward. We would reconcile our accounts. So annually, it will come to a zero sum game. So there's, it makes uh, Sue Caswell's job and the system that's working with us's job much easier. Of course, we agreed to share all of our financial records and any student records related to the uh, partnering, partnering system. And we would maintain high school accreditation or certification as a common um, expectation. So really, those are the highlights. And um, I can uh, go through the actual contract, or you can ask me um, questions about it. But I should say that uh, we are on a deadline. And if the board supports Barrington, then I would ask you to sign the agreement tonight, because it has to be hand delivered to uh, the state board tomorrow morning in order to go on the consent agreement uh, with the state board. Uh, if you don't support Barrington, that's not an issue, but that it's, a, it's an important issue for uh, making sure that we can get uh, a consent agreement. And a consent on the state board means that they look at the agreement, <coughs> they say, it looks like these two school systems did due diligence, they met all the laws, and we agree with the agreement as it's, as it's written. Um, I'll go back to my seat and answer questions of the board. Second. Wait for Jim to get back to his seat. <laughs> okay. um, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm asking it for the benefit of our audience. Um, will you explain the process that will happen if the board does vote to uh, accept the tuition agreement and sign it? In process being? What happens? The, the, Goes oh, on the okay. board article Thanks. The whole thing. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, as I said, the first step is that I if you chose Barrington tonight, the documents have to be hand delivered to Concord. That's the first step. The second step is well, the third step actually, because you are you are the first step is uh, that the voters in our community and the voters in um, Barrington or New Market um, have to have an opportunity to say yes or no as do our voters have the opportunity to say yes or no. So it takes both communities saying yes for a multi-year agreement to go forward. Um, if we said yes and they said no, it's not a deal. If they say no and we say yes, it just, it just goes, it has to take, it takes two positive votes by the people. I have a follow-up. When do the people of Barrington vote? Um, the plan is to have um, both school systems vote in March. Same day? I don't know what their, what their uh, day is. It's not important that it happens on the same day uh, legally, but I, okay. I, so I don't know what their date is for their hearing. Can I ask a third question? And then I won't ask any more on this. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious about how, how do people in Barrington, how will they determine whether or not they come here? How, how does that, what is the process for a, a parent with a child who would be <coughs> high school age? Yeah. Um, it would not be in our domain to yeah, control that. It'll be in Barrington. Just so we we'll say that the goal is 90 students and they have 110 right. students who want to go. Whatever process they develop to um, address that is, is their process. We would, we would just accept the students uh, based on the fact that Barrington says these are the students they who... They haven't shared how they would do that? No. Okay. Thanks. They mentioned a lottery. <coughs> yeah, I think they do. That's what I thought. Is there? I missed it. Sorry. I, um, I would actually like to move that we as a board um, accept the tuition agreement that has been um, outlined for us with the Barrington School District and put that as a formal motion. Second. Second by Al. Would you like to speak to the motion? I'm sorry? Would you like to speak to the yes, motion? Yes, thank you. Um, I. I would want to start, um, Dr. Morris, you complimented um, the other school boards and, and superintendents that you were working with, but I also um, think the enormous amount of work that you and your um, superintendent committee um, 
lots and lots of meetings and a process that was very public and I think we've come to a wonderful resolution. I think when we started talking about tuitioning students, our concern was our dropping enrollment and would we be able to preserve the programming we currently offer? And I think we not only wanted to preserve that, we wanted to enhance the programming that we offer. And I think this agreement ideally provides us that opportunity. It guarantees us a number of students. It does it in a transitional way, so uh, I think the impact is um, minimal, minimalized as compared to if we had uh, 250 students coming all at once. I think it adequately allows us to plan and really think where we want to put our resources. So I, I, I think this really meets our needs wonderfully, and I'm very happy to see this agreement. <laughs> So I, you know, first of all, it has been a long, windy road as everyone has been on this. But uh, what really struck me in one meeting, uh, where someone from Newmark, one of their administrative teams, said that it, any agreement has to be a win-win for both sides because you're going to have to live with it for a long time. And so, when you look at it, you know, Barrington, their you know, the primary thing they want is choice, and what Oyster River really wants is stability. And the agreement with Barrington really provides it. So it does meet the litmus test of a win-win for both sides. New Market, again, I, I have a great respect for their administrative team. I think they do a, an amazing job. The conversations that we had on education were, were great, some of the best I've had since I've been on the board. But when you look at their, this agreement, if it was New Market and the Oyster River, uh, from our side, I know there are maybe 60 to 80 kids that go to VOTEC, but it really, it's a very rapid transition where we ramp up, and then we're really going to be pushing, at the very least, up to our functional capacity. Uh, so for us, being a win, I don't know about that. From their side, also, it actually turned out in our discussions that it's more expensive to have a separate high school and a separate middle school than having a blended middle school to high school. So it start out, it costs them more money, and it, second of all, it doesn't fix their facilities. They're still stuck with a middle school that they're going to have to build or fix. So it doesn't meet the win situation for new market either. So in this case, both sides actually probably come out a little worse off. So I think the path for them clearly is to redesign and build a new junior senior uh, high school. It's what their community really wants. I think the Barrington Agreement is just a better fit for us. Since I was on the committee, just a couple things. I think that among the points that have been made about this, it's a gradual, you know, that, that in no year where you'll have a, a big influx of students. It, it's kind of controlled that way. It's voluntary so that students come here are choosing Oyster River. I think that's an advantage. Uh, the number, the, the, the absolute top cap means that we'll never exceed, you know, capacity. Uh, you know, when I started working on the committee, I think there was a kind of a sweet spot that I imagined. And th this really hits that sweet spot, I think, for us. It, fills, it fulfills our needs without, I think, putting the system under stress in the way I think the new market agreement might have. I also wanted to just reiterate what's been said. Um, I had tremendous admiration for the people in Newmarket that we worked with and, uh, you know, Jim Hayes, Cliff Chase, and particularly the two principals who are working under very difficult conditions. You know, when you think of the kinds of choices that they're making, uh, Chris Andrisky and Chris Bazone, and I think at every point they had the interests of their students in mind. It was really admirable to work with them. Um, and I was convinced also that those students had an agreement been able to be raised, they would do just fine in our district. You know, we looked at the records of them and they, they, would, they would add to our community. And that's, that's not part of the, the issue here. It's, I think it's numbers and fit and you know, this hitting the sweet spot for our own district. Other comments? Before you close it, I, I just, I'm, obviously when I was at the podium, you know, I wanted to praise the two towns, but, uh, I do want to say how much time uh, for the public that Al and you put into this process. I mean, this is tens of hours over and overnight meetings that you didn't have to volunteer for. And, um, you know, we got to this spot because we had 
quality representation at the table. Thanks. Thank you. So are we ready to vote on this? All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Any abstentions? Obviously not. Okay, so, uh, seven zero in favor with the student rep voting in favor. Barrington will be thrilled. And <coughs> as okay, we, so we'll be signing something before yeah. we leave. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> you want me to pass around? Okay. okay. Let's Let's start it with Meg and just move around. <laughs> be the first one. Okay. Now we move to the uh, elementary enrollment balance options. Um, Dr. Morris, I don't know if you want to have we want to move directly into it. If you have things you want to say before or. Um, I guess I would, would want to say how much I appreciate the community participation. Um, it's been really amazing uh, from multiple forums to most recent group of people who volunteered five hours of their time during Christmas season to work on this issue um, with me. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how much more public input we, could, we really could have gotten on the issue. We spent uh, many, many hours. Um, discussing, sharing, talking, reading emails, uh, listening to phone calls, inviting people into our offices and in, into our houses. Uh, I don't think it gets much more personal than that. So um, to everybody in the community, uh, our staff, our parents, our board members, our taxpayers, uh, thanks so much for, you know, coming to these meetings and caring enough to share your thoughts. Okay. Now, in, in looking at how we might proceed on this, we thought that the best sequence would be to uh, entertain a motion to move to a K-2-3-4 model first to see if that passes, there's no point in discu discussing the kind of details of, um, you know, balancing enrollment in a K-4 model. So I was wondering if somebody would be willing to make a motion to adopt the K234 proposal. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like to direct the superintendent to develop a plan, build and gain community consensus, and at which time implement a K2345 elementary program. In the interim, the board directs the superintendent to address the elementary school enrollment inequality, employing his professional judgment and experience. Second. Could you read the motion a second time? Because it's going to require Certainly. <coughs> to direct the superintendent to develop a plan, build and gain community consensus, and at which time implement a K2, 3, 4 to 5 elementary program. In the interim, the board directs the superintendent to address the elementary school enrollment inequality, employing his professional judgment and experience. There's second. Do we have a second? Moved and seconded. Moved by Ann, seconded by Maria. Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm going to speak to my motion. She Thank you. Um, I believe that every one of us has spent the last few months attempting to inform ourselves on the magnanimous issues before us. Our circumstances compelled me to review our responsibilities as elected officials. The primary forces, beyond our own personal ideologies, which form our opinions and guide our decision-making are New Hampshire state statutes and Department of Education rules. More specifically, Title 14, Education, Chapter 189, 1 through 3, Duty to Provide an Education, and Administrative Rules for Education, Part Ed 303, Duties of a School Board. I will paraphrase. A Duty to Provide Education 189. It shall be the duty of the school board to provide, at district expense, elementary and secondary education to all pupils who reside in the district. Two, elected school boards shall be responsible for establishing the structure, accountability, advocacy, and delivery of instruction in each school operated and governed in its district. To accomplish this end and to support flexibility in implementing diverse educational approaches, school boards shall establish in each school instructional policies that establish inst instructional goals based upon available information about the knowledge and skills pupils will need in the future. School boards shall adopt a teacher performance evaluation system with the involvement of teachers and principals for use in the school district. Then from the Department of Education, School boards are to be responsible for the development of an educational plan 
including curriculum, instruction, and assessment programs for the district, and for recommending a program of studies suitable to the needs of the pupils and the community in accordance with local school board policies, state statutes, and state board rules. In a nutshell, as a school board, we are responsible for providing a district expense in education to all district pupils, establishing the structure, accountability, advocacy, and delivery of instruction, defining instructional goals, assessing and measuring consequent student outcomes, evaluating our teacher performance, and reporting the results to the community. I believe the inherent K-2-3-4 structure facilitates aligned instruction and assessment. Our children's educational experience will benefit as a result. Best teaching practices will be shared, professional development will be tailored and targeted, and instructional accountability ensured. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Al? Okay, so I'm gonna start off by saying I think this is a really bad mistake. And I think that we've, we've, we've skipped a step, is the way I see it. It's like, if you're gonna change, and somebody wrote a letter and came up here and it really mirrored my thoughts on the whole process, and that is, if you're going to change the educational model, you first got to take a look at what you got. And we spent, I know Jim and Carolyn have spent a year and a half really, really working hard on, you know, developing ways of getting data on a baseline of what's going on in our schools. And it would seem to me the first step when you think about changing the model is looking at what we got. I know there may not be research out there about K2, 3, 4, you know, all the different models. But what we do have is data about our schools. So, I mean, my thought on it is like, what are the kneecap trends? What are we seeing with, uh, with star testing? Are we seeing big gaps between these two schools? Are, are we seeing gaps between the grades? Are we seeing failure to develop? Um, none of that's been talked about at all, even as a starting point. Um, what is the nature of the professional development that we have at both elementary schools? I mean, how are they working? What are they working on? How is the math coach working in there? Uh, how is the data that they're getting from star testing being implemented and changing the professional development? Uh, how, if you change the model, would it change the professional development and what would that look like? So in short, there have been absolutely no details about what's going on in our elementary schools. We kind of came up with a solution, but never worked through the problem where you should come to the solution. So, why to me that's important is, you know, I know Jim goes crazy when I say it about having buy-in, but this is, a, I mean, last week we had a clear case of what happens when you have buy-in. You had people come forward in the community and say they wanted a strings program. You had teachers say, you know what, we'll totally redesign ourselves to work with it. And you had the administrative team say, we're really excited about doing this and we wholeheartedly recommend it. This case, we don't have that. We're going to go into a large scale change where we don't have buy in from the teachers, we don't have buy in from the communities, and I don't think we have a full buy in on the board, at least on my end. So, to me, why I keep harping on that over and over again is that that is a strong indicator of success in programs. Programs that really work well have all three of those elements in there, they have people working together. To move into a system where we don't even really fully understand or have not even explained what we have is crazy in my mind, particularly in light of the fact that we're going to shift to Common Core. It's premature at best. I mean, this all started as a way to look at, ironically enough, getting rid of the modulars. So <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we've kind of gone off the track so far, it's mind-boggling. So I think we need to address the overcrowding issue and then when we clear all this other stuff off our plate it really is time to begin to look at educationally where we are what's going on in the elementary schools how do they mesh with the middle schools how does it fit together as a whole model we've never explained that and I think that's an essential step I can't possibly imagine shifting an educational model without doing that legwork leg work first that's my opinion yeah. In my opinion, the beauty of the motion is that that's what it says, to move towards the bed. That aside, I love the internet. I've listened to Rob tell me about the research. So I googled for advantages of K2, where it says, research shows that when children of early childhood age 
defined to age three to eight are grouped together in educational settings. There can be more of a focus on the de developmental needs of this age, which is different from grades three to five. I guess what I'm saying is, you can find what you want to support your opinion. And my opinion doesn't count for more than the seventh of this uh, group, but um, I firmly believe in the K235 because of grouping, uh, because of this town building the foundation of community from uh, kindergarten on. I also see it uh, as financial. We hired an extra teacher last year that probably would not have ha happened if we had had the K234 because we would have been able to spread uh, kids out instead of having overcrowded environment and very generous class sizes at Mastway. So it's a, f and I don't want to make the financial, the educational boilerplate. I do think that uh, for uh, the curriculum to be uh, modified or uh, made equitable through all the grades, this is the best uh, solution. Uh, but I've said before, I'm patient. So if it takes the superintendent the year two or three to gain the support and in the meantime use his abilities, which he has, uh, to deal with the numbers and the, uh, I'm happy with that and that's what the motion uh, brings us. Okay. Um, I, I would want to speak in favor of keeping a K to four and if it eventually we talk about K to five and speaking against the motion to make a K to two. Um, last night, um, I think Wayne Burton is still here. Wayne Burton's a town councilor. We were driving back from Portsmouth in the snowstorm and we were talking about serving and, and kind of talked about um, how important it is to listen to a community, but then also use your judgment. And, um, and I think that really is what we all need to do serving on a board. Um, and I think we've really heard from our community and I think our community has really spoken out against the K2234 proposal and wanting to maintain our K24. And then when it comes to judgment, I think, well, is that opinion valid? Um, because if I thought educationally we were not serving our, our children, I think it would behoove me to try to make the point why that K2 is necessary even after the public sentiment speaks against it. And try as I might, I cannot see the value educationally in moving to that K to two. I see so many wonderful things that comes from our K to four, and if we ever expand it to K to five, um, that mentoring that goes on, I think is incredible as older kids relate to younger kids. We lose that completely, I think, in that small subset. I, we talk about with teachers having this kind of horizontal kind of networking, but I think there's incredible value in the vertical networking that goes on. And the time it takes to understand a child and to, to me, education is really kind of finding that key that opens that lock. And we all learn differently. And it takes a while sometimes to figure out how a particular child learns. And I think we lose that when we make our population too small. And I, we've heard um, parents speak, and I think it really tremendously affects um, children who have I IEPs or special ed kind of needs, that those transitions are going to be very, very disturbing for them. And I think it will, it, the catch-up time um, when you move to your new school before maybe some of these things click about how to get through to a child is really going to set back that education. 
I think the community involvement in our schools is tremendous. And I think if you're a parent and you have a kid that's at one school because they're in K to two, you have a child in another school because they're in three to four, it's hard to establish that meaningful <coughs> relationship. Our schools are full with volunteers. Um, PTOs are very active in the programming. I think that they put into effect is very huge. And I think parents won't be able to do that. And I think we'd lose that as well. And I think we should respect what we've heard from our teachers as well. So I would speak against that motion. Just a, a word to kind of agree with what Kenny's saying. I think community is the hearing from the community, hearing from the community of teachers, but also the fact that what we have now are two community schools, basically. They're geographically different from each other because they serve different, very like populations, but different populations just by proximity um, to the people that go there. And I think that's something that's very valuable, that you get people who are invest more invested in their school because it's part of their community. And the other Another way of, of my looking at that was to think of, well, there are other examples of K-2 schools, as in um, Exeter, but those elementary schools are right next door to each other. So it's not as if you're changing one community and, and moving geographically very far apart from each other, but you're keeping the schools close together, which makes that much a, a much more manageable kind of enterprise if you're just having a different building but on, basically on the same campus. So I just I guess going ahead with... Um, thinking strongly to support the K through four continuation of that at this point. Megan? I have a question for Dr. Morris. Um, we had a meeting of the board in the auditorium a while back, and I asked a question about what the leadership team supported. I'd like to ask that question again, because I think there's been a lot of discussion since then is that your leadership team and yourself still support the K-2, 3, 4, either now or in the future? Um, I have not revisited that question with the leadership team since we asked it initially, um, so I have no reason to believe that they have changed their mind. And uh, in terms of the early childhood commitment, I haven't changed my mind. So, you know, I would say right now is the status quo. But I also would say that whatever decision the board makes, we'll fully implement with um, vigor. It's, there's no reason to um, belabor um, or um, assume that either the teachers or the administrators would do nothing but their best in implementing whatever decision is made tonight. But I am a strong proponent of early childhood, and that's why I proposed the model in the first place. Thanks. So I'd just like to speak um, that one of the ways that I thought about this is I tried to imagine <clears throat> the trajectory of a, of a kid in this uh, K234 model. And s just for the sake of argument, imagine this kid was at CDC for kindergarten, as many, or you know, full day kindergarten. That kid would be, go to four schools in six years. If they started in, in kindergarten in, mass, in our district with this new construct this new uh, reconfiguration. They'd have three schools in six years. And I just have difficulty imagining that that's a good situation to put kids through. Too many transitions. And I think what you lose is you lose knowledge of the kid. You know, there's a line from Cheers to go to a place where everybody knows your name. And I think when you're in a school for four or five years, everybody knows your name. They know how you learn. Uh, information gets communicated. Uh, not just education, but, you know, in terms of health, you know, in terms of nurses, knowing medications, in terms of in special needs, uh, the kinds of ways of dealing, you know, educating kids who may have difficulty learning. I think that knowledge gets lost when you make too many transitions, and I think that's, that concerns me. And I think in terms of the, the educational, you know, I, I wouldn't say that a K234 would be just totally terrible. I mean, I, there are places that have done that. I mean, you know, I would agree with that. But I think if you look, say, at... Uh, the top performing school district in, in the state, clearly Hanover. You have a school in Lyme that I think is a K-6. You have a school in Norwich, which is, I think, a K-6. And then you have the Bernice Ray School in, in Hanover. So, I mean, and they, you know, they, their scores are off the chart. So, I mean, I, I think that it can happen. I, don't, I think that a lot of these goals of strong early childhood, 
I think of curricular coordination. Uh, and I think some diversity between the schools is not a bad thing. You know, having you know, certain traditions in one school that might not be the traditions of the other school, I don't see that as a terrible, terrible thing. So, so I, I will vote against this motion myself. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to sort of speak to what's already been said. Um, I think that having two separate K through four elementary schools really sort of gives each school its own sense of identity. And when you go to an elementary school for four years, you you know that school well. Like you're you know Moharamet, you know the teachers, you know the kids who go there, and you can build relationships with students who are older than you or younger than you, maybe a younger sibling. And I think that's a valuable relationship that students can have. And I think when you're if you were transferring from a school every two years or so, I think that those relationships might not be able to develop as much. They might not be as strong. And like what Kenny said, the vertical sort of relationships, not only with students, but with teachers are very strong. And like, I think students and teachers will be able to communicate. Like students who have had teachers in previous years, their teachers for the next year will be able to communicate and just so the teachers know the students better and they will be able to teach their students better because they know their learning styles and I think that's a really beneficial aspect of the K through 4 model. Thank you. Megan? Um, I've talked to a lot of people in the community about this, uh, a lot of emotion. I mean, I tend to, I think it's not a surprise to this board that I tend to weigh a lot on the academics and I can see the academic merits that could come about if we did make a change. Is it risky? Yes. With risk comes reward, but there is risk. And I agree with what Al was saying about the community. I think there's, there's a lot of dissension. Um, I'm not feeling um, really sure about what to do. I'll be honest with you. And that's why I've asked a lot of questions to the administration, because I have not been an administrator or a leader of a school or a school district ever in my career. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to make the best decision I can and put emotion aside. And I do think, I actually think um, transition can be viewed as a positive. I think children are resilient. And I think um, learning to be flexible and adaptable, especially in this day and age, is going to be an asset for for a, an individual in whatever they attempt to do. And I'm, I'm not saying that changing schools every few years is a way to achieve that. I'm just pointing that out as I think it could be a positive. Um, I am very concerned about um, curricular and standard discrepancies from classroom to classroom in our district. And I do think the problem does manifest itself later in the later grades. And I think there's been some wonderful initiatives already put forth to deal with that, I would hope that the district will continue that work with Carolyn Eastman's work and working with the teachers. I think there's a lot of really great best practices that each teacher in, in school offers. I hope we can learn how to harness those best practices and make them more systematic so there's more equality and equity in the delivering of instruction. Um, in that respect, I, I, I respect creativity, um, you know, I think that's the wonderful thing is you, you, you go to a new class, your teacher is going to teach you about the cycle of life or something in a different way than the other teachers. Everyone has their own, their style and their own way. And that's, I think that's a wonderful gift. Every year your child gets a, a new opportunity to experience that. Um, you know, I, I also have heard, and I want to go back to my statement about the community, a lot of folks um, are very interested in the K-6, K, you know, K, K to, as far as we can go, let's say, K to 5, K to 6, K to 8, I guess we're skipping K-7. Um, and, you know, you know, intuitively, it would seem the K-4 model, if, we're, if that is something that, I don't know how it would become, you know, codified as a, as a goal, it could become part of our strategic plan, I suppose. But I am curious about which model would get us to that easier. And maybe it doesn't matter, maybe, and so that's another question I have, Dr. Morris, because I do think that if the projections do hold true for this district, I think it would be nice to have that ability, that flexibility to migrate to the K to X um, model. And I'm wondering if you could quickly comment which, you know, what would get us there? You know, what step do we take today that would perhaps facilitate that? 
Um, well, you've got competing um, uh, goals slash ideas. You have the concept of all-day kindergarten that has incredibly powerful play in the community from my read. And um, you have the concept of expanding the elementaries to fifth grade. Uh, the, this, that either one of those options can occur over time as the elementary enrollment declines. But the elementary enrollment isn't going to be declining far enough for either one of those options for um, the immediate future based on the long range planning uh, numbers. So uh, I think that at some point the board will have to say all day kindergarten is more important to us than moving the fifth grade into the elementary or moving the fifth grade into the elementary is more important to us than all day kindergarten. And the reason I say that is I don't believe the numbers support doing both of those um, no matter how, using the long range planning. <coughs> so I think it's prioritizing which one will get the, the, the most advantage. And I would, if I were given that choice, and again, I use the whole king of the mountain thing, if we weren't, uh, if we were just doing it based on what I think would be the most advantageous to our students, it would be all day K before I would move a fifth grade. Because early childhood is really where it all starts. The more we can, So, know. Mike, maybe, can I rephrase my question? Sure. So, does the K234 model make it easier to do that, or does the, the current... A4 model, which, I mean, yeah, is there any model bias to support that initiative? I don't think so. Okay. Because yeah, it's about enrollment. So enrollment, the declining enrollment space. equals space, and that space would be, uh, would serve you the model. Okay. Um, I would like to speak to the concern about transitions. My children are military children. Um, Military children move every two years. Um, I've known kids who've been in 14 schools. My children weren't in quite that many. So I guess if it's good enough for the families that keep us safe, it should be acceptable for the rest of us who have the luxury of not being moved every two years. Other comments? Maria? I'll speak to <clears throat> transitions as well, and I'm reading. Uh, transitions at the elementary school, although some research supports less transitions for students throughout the elementary years, there is also research that support that students who have the opportunity to make one transition with a larger and familiar group of the same students between grades, making the transition between the grades uh, two and three before the critical uh, middle school years, they're more adept at making that later transition because they have been accustomed at a time when they're less vulnerable than they are at those pre-puberty type of years. So again, I go back to research. It's uh, nice to quote, but you can find it on both sides unless you're a very skilled research kind of person. Well, again, I'm struck by the, the, there's a logical flaw in the motion, and that is let's pick this model and then work to consensus. It's like, that, it's completely backwards. It's like, and you say it addresses it, but no, it doesn't. It's like, you're supposed to start with like looking at what you have and then build your way to consensus. What is clearly the best model. And in my case, if, if you're saying, wait a second, it's a ch the outcome could be the same if we redistrict and move the buses versus if we go K, two, three, four, that's crazy. It's like there should clearly be a better option. And aside, again, I'm coming back to not necessarily with the outside research. What does our data show in our schools? I mean, that's the one thing we can really hang our hat on. So it's like... I just, why would you, in patience, rush to pick a model before you've clearly worked to figure out what you got? That doesn't make any sense. It's completely backwards. Other comments? So we ready to vote on the motion? So can we just, the motion is to... I'd, let, I'd like to have the motion read. Okay, could you read the motion, Anne? To direct the superintendent to develop a plan, <clears throat> build, and gain community consensus 
and at which time implement a K-2-3-5 elementary program. In the interim, the board directs the superintendent to address the elementary school enrollment inequality, employing his professional judgment and experience. Okay. Ready to vote? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Two in favor. All those opposed, please raise your hands. Five opposed. Motion is, does not pass. Okay. Um, I think at this point we need to move to the possibilities for rebalancing the schools, maintaining the K to four model. And I, th I think at this point, if you would, it seems to me there's two that have been discussed. Is that right? One in which uh, you work within districts, and one which there's a managed enrollment that, that covers essentially the entire district. Works with neighbors, and one that looks at the entire uh, district. So maybe if you talk about those two, is that, yeah, and that maybe the um, recommendation if you have it. So I would um, ask the board to go to the comparison that's in your packet where the element, the superintendent's elementary enrollment committee spent five hours and um, I'll just use Nate's name in vain since he's sitting here and I can see him. He said, Jim, are we going to come to consensus on anything? And I said, unlikely, because I populated this committee by people who are strong proponents of the K-2 model and strong components of the K-4 model. To my surprise, we actually did come to consensus. <laughs> so it was a, it was a three-hour meeting. Um, Concerts were canceled just for us, and we were able to stay longer to deal with the issue than we no we had planned, because we were under a lot of time constraints to get you something that was meaningful that you asked for. So, I, I, in the key characteristics, it does address the chair's uh, question, uh, and these are the issues that came up in the community. These are the issues that have come up with uh, staff. These are the issues that have come up with the board. So um, again, I want to thank this committee for doing the work. Now, when I say they came to consensus, they didn't come to any better consensus than you did tonight on the model. What they came in was a consensus of what they believe are key characteristics to um, reaching uh, a K-4, now that we take the K-2 model off the table. One is functional capacity, and we've defined functional capacity over and over again vis-a-vis -vis the report that we got on the capacity study. If we have a K, K through four model using managed enrollment, or if we do it through um, redoing the buses. So what came to me as we were working is the bus rerouting solution in which specific ta areas of the, of the community were identified as going to, from Moharamit to Mast Way, um, work. Now, under these key characteristics, the, the issue that we were struggling with right from the beginning was it seemed like it was always an all or nothing game. The modules had to go by September. The enrollment in the two schools had to be balanced by September. That's what I was feeling as the direction from this body. And then we spent, you know, a lot of time with community, a lot of testimony and a lot of emails. And again, a lot of personal time. I know many of you invited people into your homes as board members and shared coffee and let people um, you know, take up an enormous amount of your personal time, which you know, is really commendable. So functional capacity is critical. You know, we would have functional capacity and manage enrollment by 2016-17. Uh, removing the modulars seemed like it was critical when we started this conversation. <laughs> It really, you know, <laughs> thanks, Al. <laughs> it, as Sandy we've Brooke? listened to community members, um, as we've digested what the impact of losing the modulars would be, we really find that um, we, if we want to do this in a, in a measured way, you wouldn't want to get rid of those modulars before 2016-17. Um, splitting families. You know, this was a big driver for so many people who were so concerned that their children would end up um, going to two different elementary schools. The consensus was, we shouldn't do that. You know, the bottom line is, if there's an elementary age student at Moharamit, 
and their sibling is, is coming in, then the sibling should be able to attend Moharamet. Um, neighborhoods. Uh, we don't want to split neighborhoods, but if we go to any option, it really isn't possible not to. Now, where, do, where does that happen? If it's a bus rerouting or it's managed enrollment, and the child who gets to go is a child who has a sibling at that elementary school, then what about the sibling, what about the child who doesn't have a sibling? Could be right in the middle of that neighborhood. The child would have to go to Mastway under um, these criteria. Um, new enrollees. Everybody thinks that new enrollees should, on the committee, I'm not saying everybody in the community, because I actually met a family who doesn't like this idea a lot because their child is three. But new enrollees coming into kindergarten. Now, the committee, as a group, they said, absolutely. And then I, then, so I challenged them a little bit on this one because I'm uncomfortable with it, and I'll put it out uh, for public consumption. I said, what about PEP kits? So uh, the PEP program is four-year-olds. It's housed here in the high school. And technically, it's run by Stratford Learning Center, but at our contract, they're our contractor for the program. They said, no, they would be new to kindergarten, so um, they would be rerouted. Uh, I did tell them I was uncomfortable. I'm telling you I'm uncomfortable with it. Um, you know, if we think that families who are impacted by bus rerouting um, are vocal. You you haven't heard from the four-year-old community. They are as vocal as anybody about the advocacy for that program. And then the other one where the committee said new enrollees kind of drew a line was the children who currently live in the district whose parents have chosen to send them to an all-day kindergarten option. So they would be new first graders. In the uh, uh, criteria that we had, uh, they would be sent to Mast Way uh, based on geography. I should add that. They don't all go to Mast Way. I'm uncomfortable with that. Uh, had we had an all day kindergarten option this year, they would be right here with the rest of the kindergarten kids. So I just put that out because it's just the one place, the, couple, the one place where. Personally, professionally, I, I didn't agree with the whole group, but the consensus was clearly new is new. The all-day kindergarten potential uh, in managed enrollment is 2017-18. There's no reason to believe it wouldn't be any different if we uh, did the bus rerouting. Um, if the modulars are kept, you know, we actually could move as soon, if you really wanted to be aggressive, as, as the fall, but we haven't budgeted that, so I would say 2015-16. Um, additional buses, we know from Lisa Hupp that uh, managed enrollment won't cost us additional buses, but we also know from Lisa Hupp that rerouting those neighborhoods doesn't cost additional buses either. Uh, teaming teachers, you can team teachers within the building. Um, so, you know, it doesn't eliminate the idea, and in fact, the conversations around what's happening collegially as a result of these public conversations between the two schools is actually positive. Um, had a meeting this afternoon with teachers that said, we've got to, we've got to dispel this, this idea that these two schools are, are, um, don't that they don't like each other and they don't want to work together. And I said, well, the way to dispel that is to work together, and, and people will see, indeed, that that's important to you. Uh, balancing class sizes, you know, either one, uh, managed enrollment or rerouting buses, you can balance class sizes within buildings. You can't balance class sizes across the district, and that was one of Maria's points in relation to K2, 3, 4. If all the same grade students are in the same building, then you know, in, in, in theory, you wouldn't have to add additional staff as, as frequently, um, but, you know, that, be that as it may. Obviously, we do a lot of teacher-student matching now. You know, we do it within buildings. Uh, the idea is um, that that would continue. That's important. Uh, I've had three children. They were all completely different. I tried to make sure that they had teachers that would um, stretch them, stretch their learning as a parent. 
and avoid the teachers who didn't match their personalities. Well, we do that. Dennis and Carrie do that through a very systematic approach now where they try to make sure that every cl class is balanced, not just by gender, but by a whole host of other objective factors. They get feedback from the teachers and so forth. Teacher supported, clearly the teachers uh, are supporting a K through four model. I, we did something new uh, at the request of the com uh, enrollment committee, the, the superintendent's group. We surveyed the teachers and we were able to separate um, teachers from paraprofessionals from elementary to middle school and high school. I thought, Al, you'd get a kick out of that. Because <laughs> we're always talking about trying to do a different way of reaching out. It worked. I mean, pretty clearly, the elementary teachers, 83%, support a K through four model. And then, as I said before, you know, whatever model is chosen, the administrators are going to um, implement it with, you know, full vigor and and uh, support. So, uh, if it had gone the other way, I know the teachers would have as well. So. I know I've taken a long way to get there, Tom, but I wanted to make sure that the work of um, better than 15 people over five hours got into the public record. And quite honestly, um, as I said, most of these criteria fit rerouting the buses or managed enrollment. So I'm going to cut to the chase now, and Tom asked me which one I would do. Um, I would reroute the buses. And I will tell you why. You get all, if, if the board agrees with all of these criteria, then the this the approach under managed enrollment or rerouting the buses is slow and steady. It happens. It'll happen as a trickle in the first year, and a flood in the fifth year, meaning that those identified neighborhoods over a five-year period would become Mastway neighborhoods. It defines the location. It doesn't impact a single child who's being educated at Moharamet or Mastway. And um, in that light, uh, it's predictable. And I will give you uh, a, a real <coughs> example. About a week ago, I got a call from a parent who said they have a friend coming into the district and their friend is seriously thinking about moving here, but the question about where their child would go to school is a concern to them. And I asked them, you know, where this family was thinking about moving, and it was up by the Hannaford uh, area on 108. So that person would be, the children would be new, new to the district. There's not a snowball's chance that I would send a bus into that corner of the district to pick up that one child and drive them all the way back to Mass Way. So it's, it's a, the, the, the bus rerouting model can give us all of these benefits. It's a predictable um, pattern, and eventually those neighborhoods become, or those streets become Mass Way neighborhoods. And if all of these, all of the, all of these, um, exceptions are made, then um, those parents who were most against the, any of these models that didn't protect their current child in their current school, I think would accept it as a pattern that they're used to. And um, I, I j again, I, I want to thank the committee and all the parents and all the community members who spoke. So my recommendation, and you do have the map and the streets in your packet, would be to go back to the original way of changing the district, which is changing neighborhoods, but respect the request from the parents and the community to be predictable and allow children who are currently enrolled, who are, uh, who, and those who have siblings to be able to go to the school they um, currently go to less disruptive, more time. It's, I think we're, I mean, if we go back to um, a lot of what we've heard in these discussions, if we're listening really closely to the community, it was never about managed enrollment. It was about making sure that families were, and their children were <coughs> respected to the extent that we didn't disrupt their educational progress through transitions or through 
shifting neighborhoods kind of bluntly with a chainsaw. So um, mine would be to go back to the recommendation <coughs> of changing neighborhoods, but use these criteria to change the neighborhoods, and it would take us five years to change the neighborhoods, and so it's a five-year process overall. Um, but really, you'd, you'd, you'd attain um, equity and enrollment probably in the third year. It would be close enough that, you know, it, it but if you'll, but in the end, um, those three neighborhoods are the right neighborhoods, um, and um, that's what, that would be my recommendation. Could I just ask a question sure. to clarify mm -hmm. the friend who is moving into the district and concerned about which school to go to? What was his concern based on? Wanting to know which school their child would go to as they were making a choice, not about the district, but which school. That was because as they were looking at other property in other districts, they were able to look at schools. So, Because they liked one school better than the they, other? The or? person did not share that part of it with me, and I didn't ask that question. I think they were just concerned about travel time, to be honest with you. I have no other reason to believe anything different. Oh. So, you know, way back when, uh, <laughs> you know, this, this has been going on forever, uh, we had a communications meeting, and uh, Maria said to me, like, Al, what's your criteria that you're going to come up to make a, a decision on this? And, you know, I try to work my way through, and a bunch of other community members have asked the same thing. So I kind of put down what I thought in terms of fixing this, or really what I was looking for. And the first was at Moharamit to fix the special ed, and I don't mean to say it as there's something seriously wrong, because as Jim has pointed out, it's one of the most successful uh, special ed programs in the Seacoast. So it really is an excellent, excellent program. And, you know, not only is it excellent, but, you know, our special ed director is, is a mom that has a kid go, goes there. So it's really in good hands. But that said, you know, the overcrowding has caused some problems with the pullouts <coughs> and also with the OTPT. So, you know, I think I don't, in my mind, have a clear idea of what the perfect space is for that, but I think any solution needs to push that up to the top. The second thing I threw out there, and again, because you're a really strong proponent of it and all the data says it's a great thing to do, is what is a clear pathway to get to full day kindergarten? And when you look at Moharamit, just at the numbers, even if you keep the modulars, to have all day K, it, you can't exceed 351 kids. We're at 409, so it's like, I mean, we can go gradually, but just, that's still a good chunk of kids that you got to bring down. And then the third thing I put down, and that's directly from seeing the you know anguish of families. You know, I it was I walk out to the bus stop in the morning, I got to see it firsthand. Is that we apply the lightest touch we possibly can? I mean, it has really been a devastating thing for a lot of families to think that their kids are going to get ripped out of one school and sent to the other, and it has less to do, nothing to do actually, with one school is better than the other. They just are familiar with one school and they don't want to move. And then, ironically enough, the fourth thing I put on here is to get rid of the modulars. I, I really hate the modulars, although in my, my daughter was in you know uh, the module last year, and the teachers do an amazing job with the modulars. They're really nice. Inside, you could never tell you're at anything you know different. It's it's a great place, and there's great teachers out there, but I mean it's a waste of fourteen thousand dollars. So I'd like to use that uh, in a better way. So that's what my criteria. So my question really is: is how do we get to three fifty one? And for you know for grandfathering everyone in, and it's like ten kids a year. It's going to take us a long time to get to that you know full day K. Um, it's going to take you three to five years. You know, that's if you implement all of these, and I'm, I actually would recommend these to you. I'm not, I'm, I'm at the point where um, we have heard, I mean, we talk about listening to a community. Um, I have listened to this community, um, and like so many of you, have done it in a very personal way. And, um, you know, it's one thing to look at numbers, and it's another thing to look at impact. So, if you accept these recommendations, Al, then you're saying that it's a three to five year process. And, um, 
you know, long range planning committee could come in next year and say, oh, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's just the reality of it. I, I don't think that, I mean, we can put timelines in, which we did, but I, I also want to caution everyone that these are timelines based on current enrollment. And although we had one big bubble last summer, we can't say that's a trend. But if it happens two more times, it's officially a trend. And that would impact every, everything in terms of, of um, you know, the timeline. But if, for these three neighborhoods over a five-year period become Bassway neighborhoods, then the equity will be achieved. And if it doesn't, guess what? This board knows now how to adjust neighborhood. You know, we're not going to go through, you know, what we've done for the last, you know, year. We're going to say, okay, then pick, pick out the neighborhood that makes the most sense, apply these criteria, and start that process. So um, even though the title managed enrollment, which, you know, I certainly appreciate and have done, really what you're talking about is managing enrollment, paying attention to this every single year. Yeah and making sure that those three neighborhoods were getting the adjustment that we need. And if it doesn't look like we are, you'll have to adjust another area of the district that makes sense to Lisa. I mean, Lisa is the one that sees the geography and how her buses move. And if we're not talking about educational program, we're strictly talking about numbers, then the numbers have to ma match with the transportation system. And that's why these three neighborhoods were chosen. Kenny? Um, would do you mind taking me through, again, um, how you decided to redraw the bus line with the continuity of families as opposed to the managed enrollment um, idea that was put out? <coughs> the managed enrollment idea generated from our, our parental community because they were concerned about the um, arbitrary shifting of children and what, and then they saw the impact that the just shifting the bus routes dramatically. I mean, initially when we were talking about shifting those bus routes, we were talking about doing it this fall. Mm -hmm. So 66 children would move, 44 families would be impacted, and it's done in one year. So what the managed enrollment proponents were saying is it doesn't have to be done in one year. And if we allow the superintendent to make some informed judgment, not be willy-nilly, not be silly about it, like the Hannaford example, I would never move that kid to Massway because I'd have to hire a driver and a bus to get them there, and that's nonsensical. So what they were trying to do is come up with an alternative to the sudden transformation of these identified streets, moving children in the fall, and trying to find a way that would make some sense to the district. And I think they did. They absolutely did. I've done this model before in a 400 square mile district with 1,500 kids and 30 miles between schools. So it was a very doable model. And um, so uh, you weren't on the board at the time, Kenny, but I actually had raised this initially the last uh, year ago, October. Um, so it was resurrected, refined, great data provided, um, good people with genuine uh, um, intent and said, you know, you could slow this down dramatically and still achieve your equity issue um, if you would apply some judgment related to these criteria that we just read into the record. And there's no question we could. Um, ultimately, um, what it does leave is a, a vagueness and an uneasiness in the community that people wouldn't know exactly what school they were going to until my team made that decision. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how it worked in, you know, 30 years ago. Why I'm leaning to the ref going back to the bus rerouting is it does all those same things with predictability. Okay. So, that's the so there's no question that these streets that have been identified eventually become Mastway streets. But it takes time to do it, just like in managed enrollment. Um, so a lot of the criteria that I was using at the beginning of my recommendations have changed as a result of public input to all of you and to me. And so I've been trying to reflect that public input as we move forward in time. 
Dr. Morris, <coughs> did you consider extending um, into the the Sandy Brook neighborhood, the Wedgwood neighborhood, to the entire Wedgwood neighborhood? I, I, it's not clear to me why you didn't just take the whole neighborhood instead of cutting right down to the middle of it. Um, yeah, because quite quite frankly, the first time that I did the bus rerouting, it was like 40 children. And we had a lot of testimony about that's not enough because of the changing dynamics in the neighborhoods. And I didn't, um, I talked to Lisa about it and we didn't want to um, impact more than we had to. And so the, the, those cutoff points were specific to reaching um, equity. So to take up more of a particular neighborhood in um, our judgment wasn't necessary. So you have this one neighborhood that you've literally cut right in half. Yeah. Um, my concern is if you have a repeat of this year, next year, I'm, I'm concerned you're not going deep enough. If you're going to move, move bus lines, then you better go deep enough so that you don't have the same situation. I, I think, Ian, this really comes under the concept of, of watching what actually happens. So, you know, a year from now, it probably is too soon a year from now, two years from now, if we're not seeing the numbers shift like we thought, we'll have to take a bigger bite. No question about it. But I think as a starting point, this is 20, uh, well, it's 30% bigger than what I proposed um, a year ago. And so that was a direct result of people saying to me what you just said. I don't think you're taking a, a, enough neighborhoods and shifting enough roads and shifting them. Um, I think we have to try it and see whether um, you know we get enough students over time. If we don't, we just have to c increase. And the logical thing to do would be exactly what you're saying. Let's take the rest of that street. But um, I don't think we necessarily need to right now. And a lot of this is going to be um, experiencing it. Kenny? Um, I would like to make a motion that as a board... We don't have one yet? <laughs> <laughs> um, Before you make a motion, can I just ask, do we... So what we're, in some ways, going back to what Al said, we're, we're you know, the, I, I, I appreciate the easing, the transition ease, but also I kind of regret the fact that we're just going to, again, push kindergarten off there in the future when it felt like it was so close with the budget money being budgeted. I just wonder if there a possibility of, of making the district, the, the transition district bigger so that it facilitates a, a, a sooner transition to kindergarten? Uh, it's the same answer I gave to Ann, Ed. I think we have, have to um, implement um, and then watch. And if it may be that we get more new students moving into those neighborhoods than we anticipate. I mean, I'm thinking, uh, you know, that new students at any grade, K through four, which again is different than the managed enrollment, what they were really, um, they weren't against K through four, I shouldn't say that, any new students, but their preference would be to start K one. Mm -hmm. Mine is, if a student moves into those neighborhoods and they've never attended any of our schools, we can facilitate the shift um, sooner by um, putting them in Mastway. So again, we have to live through it a little bit before we can see whether it's working. Megan? Um, we have a policy, JEAB, that was um, changed slightly and adopted by the board almost roughly a year ago, January 2nd, 2013. And it talks about student district placement, and it says that at the elementary level, a student will attend the school which serves the neighborhood in which he or she resides, except as reassignment is necessary because of limited classroom capacity within a building or because of the limitations of efficient transportation. Um, Effort will be made to ensure that the student completes the elementary program in the school which he or she initially enters following kindergarten. So the first sentence is that we want to try to keep neighborhoods together. The second sentence will make every effort to allow a student to complete um, their program in that current school. We, I feel, I'm just, you know, I feel like, okay, we've already decided we're not making a decision that could potentially enhance academics. That, that was voted down. So now we're looking at how do we solve a problem? And I feel like if we just redraw the lines and grandfather everyone, we are not solving the problem that we 
are facing because we don't know what the future holds. We know next, well, we do know next year there's going to be overcrowding at Mohammed. We know that with, I would say, pretty darn good certainty. But we're saying we're going to just gradually let this come in, some other board, we're going to punt this thing. I think we have to make a tough decision. We either limit the amount of grandfathering, redraw the lines, limit the amount of grandfathering, rectify the problem at Moharamit. It is, it, we are not doing, it is overcrowded. And I think if parents don't recognize the impact of the overcrowding, I'm sorry that they can't recognize it. It's there. You know, we could have Dennis Harrington come up and talk about it and describe the problems. You know, the modulars, absolutely high priority, need to go. It's time. It's time. It is a colossal waste of money. And it's, it's to me, there's other issues with it I'm not going to get into. But it does impact instructional time because you are adding transition within that school day. That does not need to be there. And there's other issues. I could go on. But the teachers are doing a great job with it. They're resilient. They can, that's, that doesn't matter. So I feel like we have to make a tough decision tonight. I, I support redistricting, redrawing the lines, but I think we either have to limit the amount of grandfathering or no grandfathering or cast the net farther. And I do believe in preserving neighborhoods. It's part of our policy. We, this board agreed to this, you know, pretty much, I don't think you weren't here yet, Kenny, but you know, we agreed that neighborhoods are paramount. And, and so that's how I feel. You know, this is tough. We're going to get a lot of people angry. I'm probably going to lose friends over this. But this is the right thing to do. You know, and it's we can't allow this this, this inequity to just perpetuate. We don't know. You know what? There will probably be 100 more kids moving into Madbury. Who knows? You know, I don't know. So I feel very strongly that we, we can't just be wimpy about this. Let's make a tough decision and give, you know, the Muhammad community a school that's properly sized for what it was built for. And that would just address Megan's concern, regardless of whether we choose either option, managed enrollment or redrawing the bus lines, the language in the policy that says at the elementary level a student will attend the school which serves the neighborhood which he or she resides, that sentence has to go because it's inconsistent with current practice and it would be inconsistent with future practice if we use managed enrollment or redraw the bus lines. Well, what's a neighborhood? But that's exactly right. There right. is no such thing well, we as a could, neighborhood. We could get into that and spend a couple hours. And you were making a motion. You wanna... Well, I was just, I, you know, I just heard Megan. I was wondering what you, what you feel that bold step should be then. <laughs> I, I think we need to redraw the lines and you know, unfortunately, I think we need to get some input from Lisa on what is, I don't, I don't know which one, which way is the best. And I don't like, I don't, why is this, I want Dr. Morse to make the decision. <laughs> I mean, I want him to make the recommendation. Yes. Obviously, I've said that like 10 times, you know. I, so before I, I make a motion, um, when, when we were hearing about the managed enrollment um, plan that, that had been presented. Um, what struck me, and it really all the options have downsides. I think we all recognize that. They're all, they're, there's a group of people that are more affected. There's, um, if we don't achieve, as Megan pointed out, the, the size decrease timely, it sets off as Al pointed out, kindergarten. Um, so I, when I first heard about the manage uh, enrollment and then heard about the uncertainty and what I thought was to do a hybrid model where we redraw the bus line and over the first maybe year or two years do some managing which would speed up that process and don't know if that would be I think that, yeah I don't think it is Ken um, only because I think it, it confuses people you know, if you're saying that these particular uh, streets are going to be converted to Massway, but in the interim, the superintendent is going to get to place those students based on his best judgment, I think that people would say, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense to us. Either everybody gets treated the same way across the district where you're saying, you know, they're making your best judgment based on special needs, balancing the enrollment between the two schools, 
bus busing availability. Um, you know, you you create the criteria. I think it's it, it just makes more sense if you choose one model or the other. Um, mm -hmm. And in you know, I just think it makes it much easier for the community to make have some sense of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to make a motion that we redraw the bus lines um, and discuss the extent as a separate motion. Sure. Is there a second? No. Second. I'll second. And that um, would that include the full continuity? Um, Student in a school stay in the school? No, no, no that's okay. separate. That's why I said keep that okay. whole thing goes separate. Basically, we're voting, may I speak? We're voting whether we want to redraw or do managed. That's how I look at it and frame it in my mind. I make a motion that we redraw. I just wanted to speak to it because I don't think they're mutually exclusive, actually. I mean, the whole part about managing is that you manage it. Because so, we, I mean, Jim said early on that this would be a really bad thing to go through, and I, you know, didn't believe him. And he stole it right. And it's like, we can't allow it to drift again. I mean, so the managing part really is more about exactly what Jim is saying is that every year you're kind of looking at it and you don't let it get out of whack so i don't think they're mutually exclusive i you know i think the idea of setting a solid line is a, is probably a better idea it gives people some certainty and that seems that there's been a lot of you know i mean i did like the thing in the policy where we said hey by march 31st you get this time stamp so it's like we have a rush because it's always hard to get people to come in but nonetheless giving people some certainty i think is probably a good idea Mm -hmm. I guess I'd like to speak. I, I'd like to see if we could make a decision tonight. I think we're, we have enough information. Uh, I think the, you know, the the grand. I think that your what you propose would get us there. It would get us there, maybe slower than some people would want. I think it would mean that Muhammad would have to teachers of Muhammad would have to step up to the plate again one more year. Then I think after that there's going to be a decline, but I think they've done that. I think if, in terms of the overcrowding there, if we get the new gym, I think that will dramatically relieve that. So I think it'll be a better situation in Muhammad next year, even if they had the same numbers as they do this year, even though with this decline, they sh you know, projections, it would get smaller. Uh, so um, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to see us not put off one more time the decision about grandfathering, I'd like to see us kind of like wrestle with that, you know, the amount of grandfather, I'd like to see us wrestle with that tonight a little more. Yeah. But I, There's a I'd motion like on to, the table. I'm sorry? There is some motion. Yes, and I'd like mm -hmm. to um, make an amendment to the motion that um, in addition to redrawing the bus line, that we use the grandfathering uh, criteria, which is the continuity of if you're in a school, you'll stay in the school. And if you have a sibling that is still in that school, you will enter that school. And so in, in, Ken, in that particular scenario, we're all recognizing that the situation that happened this year where a child had graduated from the high school that, and we have an incoming child. No, it's in, in that particular school. Just the elementary. School. Right, just that elementary school, exactly. Okay. Um, is there a discussion of the of the? Is there a sec second to the? Say, could you say the? I I, I think it'd be good for us to hear the amendment okay. repeated. Okay. So the, the original motion is to redraw the bus line, mm -hmm. and I wanted to add an amendment to that that, in redrawing the bus line, that we respect continuity, which means if you're already in a school, you stay in that school. And if you have a sibling who is in that particular school, you will go to that school. Even if the sibling wouldn't be there at the same time? No, no, if, it, if that sibling is still in that school, if okay. the sibling has moved on, then, that, then, you're, then you'll go where the bus line tells you. It's only if that sibling is still remaining in that school when the new child enters the school. <laughs> 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 
What is the <laughs> amendment? <clears throat> um, All of that. <laughs> okay. So, so essentially, your the, the amendment is for a gr a grandfathering all students currently in school and siblings of those students if they would be in the school at the same time, you know, so that you don't splitting families. Exactly. Okay. Which is similar to your proposal, you know, what you recommended, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, discussions of the amendment. Was there a second to yeah. the amendment? Was there a second? I don't think there was. I'll second the amendment. Can I discuss it? I, I okay. think um, the reason I made the amendment is I think that we've really heard from the community how much they value that a student is not moved out of a school that they're currently in <laughs> and also that tremendous value that if an older brother or, si or sister is in that particular elementary school mm -hmm. that they don't want their younger child going to a different school mm -hmm. and that's why I added that amendment. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Morris, could you clarify whether or not children who are in the PEP program the, or either of the other kindergarten programs in the community if they're considered in our school system? Well, the, I mean, one of the, the easier answer of that question is that children who are currently enrolled in an all-day kindergarten outside of our district are not considered enrolled in our district. And Catherine and I actually had this conversation related to the PEP program and even though uh, it's contracted out to Stratford, we consider them part of the pre-K through 12 program. So I would consider them administratively, as did, and Catherine agreed with me, that um, we would consider them as par already enrolled in the system. Um, unfortunately, the PEP program is not an open program to all students in the Oyster River District to attend Correct. the preschool program. So I have grave difficulty with that that um, position you're taking. There's no parity for families who might have attempted to get into the program and didn't. And let's say they live right next door to a family whose child is in the PEP program, and so they get to go to, and let's just say that family with a child who didn't get into the PEP program, the family moved to this district 15 years ago, has lived here longer than anybody else in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. with a preconception of where their child was going to school, whether it meant the school was better or not better, is irrelevant. Um, I can't support busing or the motion based on the continued overcrowding and on the lack of parity for uh, people in our community. Al? So I actually like the way Megan is trying to move us. It's like kind of piecemeal uh, that we take care of the, that we're going to redraw the line first and then get into the discussion because it's, we're kind of locked in with the grandfather, grandfather and grandmother, whatever we call it, because we're speaking to the motion. <laughs> uh, so I, I think I, I don't like the amendment. Let's, let's say we're going to redraw the line and then, then we can take up the conversation of, of how much we're going to grandfather and what the size of these neighborhoods are. It just is a more logical way to get it done. We're moving in a sequ sequential way that we will make a decision. I just, it's a better way to do it, I think. I think so too. That's why I did it that way. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And I also agree with Ann. Mm -hmm. Sorry, is there further? I, I, if you're willing, I'm willing to withdraw that motion and do it sequentially. Withdraw the amendment. Withdraw the amendment. Do you want to do the whole thing? But, but yes, Tom has to amendment. <laughs> okay, I'll agree. Okay. Can I just yeah. say that could we speak about making exceptions rather than grandfathering since that is a phrase that has come out of Jim Crow Southern American history and it's racist as well as sexist and it should stop being used. <laughs> and in these hallowed halls of public learning, we shouldn't use it. So exceptions, that's... Works for me. So the motion has been withdrawn. So we have the amendments. The amendments are withdrawn. The motion, could we, hear, could we have a repetition of the motion? Could we hear Sorry. that again? 
Megan Turnbull moved to redraw the bus lines and discuss the extent of them under a separate motion, second by Al Howland. Okay. So essentially, we're voting on whether we're going to redraw the bus, redraw lines. The bus lines. Okay. Are we, is there further discussion on that? Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Oh, let's see. One, could you, I'm sorry, I'm slow counting. So. <laughs> all those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six in favor, all those opposed? One opposed. Uh, I'm sorry. You, you yes, voted? I was in favor. Okay, and the student represent was in favor. So the motion passes. Okay. Al? So, you know, I, I, I'm nervous about the, you know, if you grandfather everybody in, that it's... Uh -oh. it Exception. Is, I'll, I'm sorry. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it take me a while. The reason I feel so wacky with the gavel. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have, if we accept everybody, it's it's only ten kids, and we go from like four oh seven to like three ninety seven. We're still we still are overcrowded, and maybe it's just because I'm scarred for life because I grew up as a Cubs fan, and it, it always the worst thing happened. It, it it makes me nervous to be that close to the the edge. So, I mean, it seems logical to me, and I, I know uh, Ann brought it up, is to expand out and take the whole Wedgwood neighborhood. It, I mean, I live in the neighborhood. It, 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 you know, it really is a neighborhood where kids play together. It's a logical thing to take the whole neighborhood. It gives us a little bit more breathing room, and it makes the idea of exceptioning, as Kenny was pointing out, an acceptable thing. It gets us, you know, gives us a little bit more breathing room in case the worst case scenario happens, which I think is a good idea. Yeah. Um, the Wedgwood and the Sandy Brook neighborhood are uh, the historic punching bag for redistricting. Uh, in 2000 or 2001, um, I know a family where the mother taught at Meharimut, the two brothers attended Meharimut, and the sister who was entering kindergarten was sent to Massway. She's now an extraordinary student. Um, it, she's graduating early from her school in Chicago. I can't think of the name. She's on the honor roll. Apparently, transition didn't hurt her too much. And uh, but just a, just a point that if, if you want to punch up a neighborhood, just just pick Wedgwood and Sandy Brook because they they're used to it. And that's because they're logical locations on the, <laughs> on the bus routes. The ten. Can you go over the number of students being affected here, the incoming? Well, we, we only can. And with the PEP program and without and things like that, what, how many number? what are the numbers we're talking about here? We don't know. So the, the answer is that we're making best estimates based on past um, enrollment. And we are estimating that in the kindergarten that approximately seven students would shift in the upcoming school year. Okay. What we don't know is how many students would shift in grades one, two, three, and four because we don't know how many new families would be moving in. We always have new families. What struck us last summer was no one anticipated 30 additional children, no one, because you just can't predict that kind of thing happening. So there's always going to be new children. There are always going to be new children in these neighborhoods. People move, houses sell, so forth. So my best guess is it would be more than seven. And to say it's going to be 15, I don't know it's going to be 15. I don't know it's going to be 12. I don't know it's going to be 20. Um, so I get where, you know, Ann and Al are coming from. If you make the <coughs> net bigger, the possibility, or the likelihood is that the number of new families um, comes into play and you'd have a greater number. Oh. I don't mean to cut off the conversation, but I'd like to make a motion that we, uh, with redrawing the line, that we have a exclusion, as Kenny pointed out, which would be that Students that are currently going to either Moharman or Massway are allowed to continue going to their existing school, and that their siblings uh, as would also go to that same school as long, only if 
word that only if they were both in the elementary school concurrently. Um, and I would also add that we expand the uh, the rerouting to include the entire Wedgwood neighborhood. Is it going to be? This is a motion. Mm -hmm. Good. I second. Second. Or do you want me to actually do one? All right. Yeah, I'll take that off. Let me rephrase and just say that we <coughs> grant. I'm gonna. Have, you have to hit me with this, Maria. That we exception uh, all students that are going to their existing school, uh, and that their siblings are allowed to go to that school while they're concurrent. And you second. Wait a second. Okay. Could I ask a question? If there are parents of children in Moharamut that are strongly into academics and feel that being in an overcrowded school is not in their child's best interest, do they get to choose to go to Mastway? I don't see any reason why we would say no to them if they wanted to voluntarily to move and the bus accommodated it. We have families now in both schools who transport their child themselves because um, they started out in one school or the other and then moved. And we always let them stay in the school through you know, personal transportation. So we wouldn't provide busing? We don't. We wouldn't if it was official policy of the district, but we don't now. Is there a second? Is there a second to Al's motion? I second. Kenny did. Second. Kenny second. Does that include the program? Second. So how? So what is that? What is the net impact of doing that? Um, it's a conceptual impact that Ann was promoting that Al picked up on. Where if your net is wider, you're likely to have more new students enrolled so in the we, district. So we really don't know if it's going to solve any problems. You it may not no. solve any. It may yeah. be like doing nothing. Or it, it might may be, be like doing something dramatic. We no, don't know. I, I doubt like every single, you know what I mean? Like I know. how many I'm, houses I'm just are going to sell It's an articulated range. I mean, we're dinky little Durham. It's not that many houses, you know. I don't think we're solving the problem. I don't, I don't think, I think we're, I don't think, you know, I don't like, you know, what, we have to do it, but I think it, it, we're not solving the problem still. So that's how I feel. I think we have to look at it limiting the amount of grandfathering. I think that is a deeper cut. And the sibling thing is, you know, that's too bad. You know, I'm sorry. I don't know. You know, we, we have overcrowding at a school and we have, it, there are issues and we have modulars that are, have out, you know, that should not be there anymore. And we have, you know, we have teachers with different loads of, of responsibilities because they have more students in one school than the other. It, it's it's inequitable. It's we're not solving the problem. My okay. feeling. Okay. Um, I I understand um, the point that there isn't this dramatic shift in numbers, but I think that what we've heard as a board is we've heard that what's really important is to keep those families together. And we really haven't heard concerns that the academics at Moharamit are greatly impacted or impacted at all by the numbers there. And I think people have risen to the occasion and um, accommodations are made. And I think if we were sitting at those forums or our meetings and we heard time after time from parents saying they thought their, their children's education was being negatively impacted, I think that would lead to a different conclusion, but we're not. And more what we heard is we want families together. And that's why I would support what Al has, has suggested and made a motion to. Is there further discussion on the motion that Al Howland has made? Could we have the motion read? <laughs> sure. Okay. Al Howland moved to use the exception criteria that if you're currently in the elementary school, stay in the school and siblings can attend if they are in the school concurrently. Mm -hmm. Second by Kenny Miller. Okay. So, we're ready to vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. We have four votes in the student rep voting yes. All those opposed? 
Three voting no. The motion passes. Does that, Dr. Morse, does that give you enough direction to go forward now? Uh, yep. Yeah, I just want to make um, it clear in, in what I just heard is the only exceptions we're going to make is if they're currently in the school or while they're in the school, their sibling enrolls, then that would be the exception. Um, everything else we talked about tonight is not an exception based on that. So PEP, all day K, those are not part of the exceptions. It's pretty limited to specifically enrolled kids. Yeah. So yes, it does. Al? Okay, so I th again, I think we should, my third thing of the, is I think we should expand the redistrict to include all of the Wedgwood neighborhood. It's really a logical thing. It's a big neighborhood. It has houses that are really family friendly, that are people that are likely to be moved in. I've, you know, it's only anecdotal evidence, but I've seen it change over the 15 years I've been there. And it gives us a little bit more breathing room. I, I'm really nervous about having being this tight. Uh, and I think it do, by having those big blocks that we've, that Jim has put into this redistricting, it really does move, and we're not kicking the can down at all, we're just kind of gr moving it up slower than we would have when we just took the 66. So um, I think it's a good idea. So with that said, I'd like to, do you want to speak to it, Ken? No, I was, I was going to second. I'd like to make a motion that we include the entire Wedgwood neighborhood in the redistricting and that that whole neighborhood would then go to Mastway. Okay. And I'll second that. Okay. Is there, some est is there some estimate of how many kids might be moved from that neighborhood? Well, once this is done, and Lisa and I will sit down and go through what you've moved tonight and try to make a best guess. But again, it'll just be based on past enrollment mm -hmm. with last year being the exception. Okay. Is there discussion of the motion? Um, I, th the reason I support it um, is twofold. One, I think it does keep a community, a neighborhood um, more intact. And I think as that was pointed out, that's part of our policy. And I think that if it is going to maybe push us further to getting that, in quotes, equity in numbers quicker or safer, I think that's a good idea to do. Other discussion? Okay. Could we have the oh, motion? I, my, only, my only discussion is I think it's a good idea. I, I appreciate expanding the district. I just don't. I'm not familiar enough with the bus routes or the geography to actually say, oh, well, that's the neighborhood. You know, I don't really, I'm just going to say, oh, good idea, but I'm not, you know. So I'm, I think that it's, it's, I, 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 I guess I'd leave that on the superintendent if he's comfortable with that and thinks that that's it's within the, logical. The, the bus redistricting and things too. I just want to hear that you, that that makes sense from your perspective. It's the logical extension of a neighborhood. Other discussion? Could we have the motion read again? Certainly. Al Holland moved to include the entire Wedgwood neighborhood in the redistricting, and that neighborhood would attend Mastway, second by Kenny Rotner. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Seven in the affirmative, student representative in the affirmative. <laughs> Are there other? Does that give you enough direction then to move forward? I believe it does, uh, Tom. So I, I'll work with Lisa to make that uh, change and do some updated estimates. Okay. Are there other motions to be made? Or just, yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to make a motion. Bear with me while I find it. Um, to charge the superintendent to continue to gain community input and consensus on the best elementary school model for the Oyster Consolidated uh, Cooperative School District. I'll second. Yeah. What's the last part, model? On the model for the ORCSD. Um, may I speak to sure. it? This discussion the discussion of K-2 is new to this board, but it's not new to the school board. Uh, the, the discussion started before my tenure, before Megan's tenure. Um, 
and it got legs when we had overcrowding. Was it the right way to open up the discussion about K2? No, because it didn't open up the discussion talking about the merits of K2. It was simply a solution to our overcrowding. So I would like the superintendent to continue to pursue educational models, elementary educational models, uh, K2, K8, um, to understand how we would best serve our district, serve our children, empower our staff to deliver the best education that we can. Um, I, I agree with the spirit of what Ann's talking about. I think we need your help to know what is best. Our, our students today are facing challenges that students of Voice River may not have necessarily faced in the past. Um, there's a lot of differences in terms of, um, you know, challenges of getting into um, higher, you know, getting into colleges, finding work in a in, a, in an economy such as ours um, that is really tied to broader macroeconomic factors, um, in, you know, because of our what we call global economy. I think we do need to look at look at the, the model. I think there are so many things happening in this country that are worthwhile exploring happening beyond this country. Um, we, you know, Ann and I were, were, were intricately involved in, in, in hiring you and bringing you here, and we really would love to hear about what you think we could do and, and help us help the district develop a roadmap. Because I, I just, you know, I think that we could do things better and prepare our children more effectively for the future. And um, I think there's a lot of wonderful things that I didn't think that. I can live anywhere in this country. You know, my husband has such a job that we could live anywhere. We're here because we're committed to being here. We think there's the things that are here are, are worthy of staying. But um, we have, you know, how much is our budget? Almost $39 million. Um, a lot to work with. Let's, let's see what we can do. And, and let's think out of the box a little bit. And, um, you know... I support pursuing that exploration. Other discussion? Could we have the motion read again? Oh. Uh, to charge the superintendent to uh, gain community consensus and input on the best elementary school model for the Oyster River Cooperative School District. <coughs> I'll speak. I, I will vote against this. I think we've gone through a process of putting two models out to the community, and I think there is a consensus to retain the K-4 to four model. I think that this issue, we need to move on to some other questions. I think teacher evaluation is a huge issue coming before us. Uh, I think in general we should, of course, you know, try to evaluate the quality of education in the elementary schools, the middle school, and the high school. But I think that to continue to pit the K-2, 3, 4, and the K-4, and the K-5 against each other, I think is non-productive. That's my view. So I'm going to vote against this. Al? Yeah, I have to agree. I, you know, I, I think that we, there's this really great educational conversation that's waiting to happen that we keep stalling with this idea of shifting the chairs around. It's like I, I'm more concerned with, you know, if I look at Moharam and if I look at Mast Way, What's going on in the school? Uh, what you know? How is the assessment working to change the the uh, instruction and, and and how is that adapting over time? And that's I think that's I mean the community is dying for this I think from what I've heard and I I know I am and I think we we just need to move past and get to that discussion. Megan, go ahead. Let Ann speak. Yeah. I think the two of you didn't hear what I said. That's what I was going to say. Okay. I didn't say K-2. Right. I said best educational model for our school district, which, Al, I hate to say it, but it's what you said earlier in the meeting. That's about continuing this discussion. It's having discussion, a conversation, opening up the box, something that I've never seen happen in this district before. How do we deliver ed education to kids? And just because we've done it since the inception of this district, does that mean it's the right one? Mm -hmm. How do we know unless we have the conversation? I think we're being very myopic. I think we're not recognizing that there are other options beyond K-2, 3, 4, 
K-4, whatever. I mean, there are districts in, you know, in this country that don't have grades in the elementary level. You know, you know, why we should not be holding children back. I'm not saying that we're, this is the model I want, but I'm saying there are places where they're doing some really interesting things. And I think we need to broaden our horizons, think beyond our borders. We, we, we need to have that kind of constructive, constructive educational dialogue with the community and it should be ongoing. And I, I fully support the spirit of Anne's motion. I think it's about putting students in the forefront and in, in questioning and making sure we're, we're doing what we should be doing. And, you know. Could I hear the motion again? Sorry. Charge the superintendent to gain community consensus and input on the best elementary school model for the Oyster River Cooperative School District. I hear what you're saying and I hear the, the comments. I, I feel in a way though it should not be to charge the superintendent to do that, but I think it is discussions we should start having at the board table and that we should start um, to be able to have those conversations about education. And some of our budget workshops were some of the most, to me, productive and inspiring conversations we had. Um, working on that uh, strategic plan, the academic piece, those were very enlightening. And I think that rather than having the superintendent going out to try to find models or um, different kinds of formats, I think we should really have time at the board table to talk about education and not just nuts and bolts, which unfortunately we seem to do a lot of. Thank I'm you. happy to modify my motion to have the superintendent lead the board Lead the board. Can you finish that? Megan, what do you think? You want me to repeat your motion? <laughs> um, I would charge the superintendent with leading the board um, to investigate through um, community input and de development and or, or uh, gaining consensus um, what is the best elementary school model for our district? Can you re repeat that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I charge the superintendent to lead the board in the discussion to learn what, through community input and consensus, is the best elementary school model for the Oyster River Cooperative School District. Okay, the motion has been moved, seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. I, um, I don't, it seemed in, at some point there used to be, the board would set goals, is that true, that there would be? <laughs> oh, yes. Was that? Because mm -hmm. I, I don't remember, since and I've been on the, the board, I don't remember that, that we, set goals. we came with kind of a, a goal setting kind of <laughs> meeting. And I, I think that would be something more to put as a board goal is to set aside time to have these discussions and maybe um, whether there's material to to be reading or looking at um, mm -hmm. as opposed to the a formal motion to do that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, other fur further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hands. We have one, two, three, four in favor. All those opposed? Motion passes by four to three. Is there further discussion on the issue of um, equity in the elementary schools? Kenny? Um, sorry to drag it up, but I, I think one thing that is very clear to us is that the longer change does not happen, and if there is not equity, the harder it is to correct it. And will there, will, should we do a formal policy that states um, let's say every three years or so that we look at that line and adjust that line if the numbers so warrant and make that a board policy. I just, because uh, I, don't, I don't think any board should wind up in the position that we were in, um, and I think it's preventable. Megan? I'd like to make a motion for the board to charge the policy committee to re-examine policy JEAB, student district placement, 
or considerations um, that were discussed this evening? I'll second that. Could, could you say the motion again? Can't say it verbatim. Again. Review JEAB at the policy <laughs> committee level for a report to the board. Yeah, to include the spirit of what I, you know, what Kenny was saying, you know, to mm -hmm. putting some more language into our policy um, in order to ensure future yeah, boards aren't in the okay. same position. So, 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 so there would be periodic reviews. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, other, and if there's other elements that we feel. I'll second that. I think that's. And then present it to the board, and then we can all talk okay. about it again. Okay. So I'll second that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a policy to, uh, to cyclically review our policies every three years. Mm -hmm. So I'm not so sure we need a policy that says review the bus policy every three years when we, in fact, review the policy every three years. So in our, in our uh, committee meeting, I, we should perhaps incorporate into that policy language that speaks to um, that the, it's an ever-changing target. So you could do that without a motion, right? No, you'll read the policy. We'll bring no, it no, back to you. No, but I mean, you could. You don't need a. Do you need a motion for for now? No, you to get go. it. Well. Yeah, I think that's what you're saying. That's that's already in. The no, my point was we don't need to create a new policy that says review the bus policy every three years because no. we review policies every three that's years. That's what I said. Yeah. Okay. No, no, and that's not what Megan said. Megan's Megan is concerned. It, it's not with. Re, re, no. Well, so I don't think you guys need a motion to, to review a policy, do you, Jim? No. <laughs> and that's like, I mean, Before I like the way you answer I'm not a policy person. Oh, you're Jim. 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 I'm not Jim. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think there. I think what Megan is looking for, and in, in this case, maybe one of those exceptions, Al, is direct from the board to say, pull this policy, pull this policy and make it consistent with the decisions we've made tonight. Plus. Um, make sure I would be recommending in that discussion a report annually on the impact of these decisions. So I think she's looking for an accountability piece and a yeah. consistency piece because the current policy is inconsistent with the decisions we made tonight. Okay. Yes. And it's just a matter of, of fact. We wouldn't review that policy again for another two years. Okay. Okay. Megan? And that was my point is that we this wouldn't come up for another two years. And okay. so in order to get it on the plate of the policy committee, I need the board to charge the policy committee. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. Other discussion? All those in favor? The motion passes unanimously. Student rep voting yes. Um, would we be ready to move to public comment? Are there, is there additional? We've done an extraordinary amount of work tonight. <laughs> um, um, is with, without a, could I move to public comment? Then we, we have a, a um, non-public session after that, as I understand, okay? So um, anyone wanting to speak publicly? Three minute limit? Uh, Laura's got something. I'm sorry. Dean, Dean Rubin Lee, I want to congratulate the board on uh, making these decisions that have been tearing everybody apart for a very long time. I think they did great. Uh, uh, the one thing I would quibble with is by adding the extra fraction of a neighborhood, we may end up shifting too many children. Hi, I am Lauren Selig from here in Durham. And um, first of all, thank you for finally making a decision. I wish it had happened four months ago, as I'm sure a lot of people do. Um, there are a couple of questions that I have as a result of tonight's meeting. Um, one goes back to the discussion about tuitioning. I don't know if you remember we talked about that earlier, or you did. Um, one of the numbers that came up is what the average cost is for a student in Oyster River. And one of my questions is, what's the cost for an average student who's not receiving any special services. So we know that there are some students receive a, a wide range of services, and it may be as simple as they're getting additional reading support within the classroom, or it may be that they are being, the district is paying for them to attend a special school, and all of those have different budget impacts. But for a non-special ed, non-exceptional learning student, 
who is receiving no special services beyond attending regular classes, what's the actual dollar cost for that child? And so that when we're comparing, we can look at apples to apples. That's one of my questions. Um, the other is, uh, by the time you guys got done with the whole conversation about what, where you're redrawing the bus lines, I'm not clear anymore about those neighborhoods off Mill, because that's not Wedgwood. That's a whole other neighborhood. So um, we'll I know that. Yep. that that's getting clarified. And in terms of the, um, what was the word? Exceptioning. Thank you. Um, I might offer as a suggestion, as an idea, that perhaps rather than making a blanket group about all students who currently have siblings, that it's looked at a little bit more carefully. So perhaps there's a family that only has a child in kindergarten this year, and then there's two or three or four more siblings behind. Maybe that family's not exceptioned. Maybe that family's redistricted because it makes fiscal sense. <laughs> Because one of the conversations that didn't come up is where are the bus is going to go and how long are you going to continue offering busing to both schools from houses that are across the street from one another where students start in different years. And so um, I would, I would it, encourage looking at exceptioning not as a blanket, this is what it's going to be for all students with all families, but this is what it'll be for the majority of families if they choose it. And I, I like the fact that if they don't want to be exceptioned, they don't have to be. So thank you. And also, um, thank you very much to Katie Fiermonti and the PTO for the outstanding performance that the elementary schools from Moharamet went to today. Um, my daughters have been wanting to act out the play all afternoon. So thank you. Hi, Jocelyn O'Quinn Durham. All right, I've had time to think about this now. Um, first of all, congratulations. You all made a decision. Um, I think that's really amazing. Um, Unfortunately, you didn't solve my problem, or you did, but by the time you resolve, it sounds like the overcrowding in Moharamet, barring any really strange changes in people moving, my kids will be in the middle school. So thank you, but my original concern has not been addressed. Um, I know we might have seven less kids there next year, but it's a drop in the bucket. So it's good news that for kids coming up into the system, but not for my children. Um, so I just want to bring up, I've talked about this before, and I think it's a little lesson in history about PEP. When my kids were in PEP, um, my son moved three times. I think he moved three times in three years in PEP. And at one point, the students were broken up, I think, into Moharamit and Mastway the last year, and then eventually they went to the high school for PEP. And my daughter, who has an IEP, went to two different schools for PEP. And, you know, while I went through this, maybe it's because my kids were so young, I didn't even know that I had a choice to say anything about anything. I was so happy with PEP and I was so happy with the teachers that we just kind of went along with it. We didn't think we had a choice. And in retrospect, I'm glad I didn't overthink it because had I overthought it, I would have been very concerned about transitions. Had I read some of the research you were all talking about, I probably would have been um, very anxious and, and to no end. And so I think there's a lesson here in that I think community dialogue is a really good thing, but I think that it can be dangerous too because you've made this decision tonight that doesn't fix a problem in my view, but the process has somewhat divided the community. And I don't think that's anyone's fault. I think it's just a byproduct, but we have talked about it so much and we've all become experts that there's a lot of hard feelings. And, and I wish we hadn't gone through this at all in a way because it, it didn't solve my problem. Um, so as we move forward, I hope we're able to engage in civil and fruitful community dialogue and find a way to engage um, the leadership team as part of that dialogue. I feel like they really weren't engaged as much as they should have been, that you know, community experts and parents had a louder voice than the leadership team because they still don't quite know where they were coming from. Um, and my last comment is, as I heard talk tonight from many board members, it, it really sounds like you heard loud and clear people's fear of change. And so we've come up with a situation that really doesn't make anyone change for a long, long time. Um, but I feel like you ignored some of the facts. And the facts are Moharmit's overcrowded. It will still be overcrowded now. Um, that's a fact. I'm not speculating. I know this. And there's data to support that. Another, I think, fact or um, something that's actually happening is that our leadership team supported a K-2, and we never talked about that. So I feel very frustrated that we, we talked a lot about fear, we talked a lot about speculating on what's going to happen to our kids, but I feel like you missed the um, really important point that there is an impact on academics in bigger class sizes in crowded schools. And, you know, for all our talk about academics... Well, Harriman's still going to be overcrowded until my kids are in middle school. So um, 
I don't know. I just, I'm very disappointed that it has happened this way. And I think that going forward, I'd like to hear much more from the leadership team because I think that they probably had some really valuable perspective and we, we didn't get to hear it. So, thanks. Jacqueline Brune, uh, Durham. And thank you for making a decision as well. I just wanted to just speak to the portables since that came up a lot. And I understand it's a cost that the board doesn't want to um, have my sons in a portable this year. And it's an amazing classroom. The two teachers that are in the portables, uh, Mrs. O'Burn and Mrs. Schmidt, do incredible, incredible things. They did a wax museum that they do there. They just finished their Bazaar Bazaar. And they raised almost $1,000 from you know crafts that the kids made. Um, that go to families in need in the communities. They have incredible bird feeders in the back uh, behind them. So it, just listening to all of you talk about these portables, these terrible places, and yes, they do take longer to get to, to places, I understand that, but th they're great classrooms. Uh, it's in no way less um, for my child's learn experience at Moharamet. Um, and in fact, I think they've been, there's been a lot of kids sick at Moharamet this, this last little period and they've been pretty healthy out there so <laughs> i don't know maybe it's nice going out in the cold air and coming back um and then just to talk a little bit just overcrowding i know it's late we came from california school that was built for 350 um, students and there were 550 and that was an overcrowded school and it's all perspective um but moharam it's an amazing place and i'm so thrilled even if it stays at 417 or 420 or whatever the number is right now for all of the years my daughter's there, she's in kindergarten, it's going to be a wonderful place. So thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you all. Somebody uh, a motion. Roll call. Uh, <coughs> so we need a roll call motion. Should we check the future dates first and then? No, oh, okay. Okay. So we have uh, our next meeting, the 2nd, then the 15th, and we have a pub, I think that's a public hearing, not a pubic hearing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Man. Yeah. Boom. Okay. Yikes. Picky, picky. Yeah. Well, a letter can make a difference. <laughs> um, Kenny? So I'd like to make a motion. Um, Based on New Hampshire state law RSA 91-A3 Roman numeral 2, uh, subscript E to move into non-public, subscript E is consideration or negotiation of pending claims or litigation. Okay, so we need a roll call vote on that? I have a second, uh, actually. A second? Okay. Roll call vote to go into non-public session. Charlie, aye. Al Holland, aye. Ann Lane, aye. Maria Barth, aye. Tom Newkirk, aye. Can you remove aye? Megan Turbo, aye. Okay. Peter Sport, aye. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it's a non-public. Non non Do I vote on it? Yeah.